play, play with the composition of sound and space, and even playing with the non-human and more than human play. The first panel is an hour of 15 minute papers followed by 30 minutes of discussion, then a short break, and we're back at 11 a.m. Central Time, which is 5 p.m. British Summer Time, for the same format in the second half. We would also like to open with an acknowledgement that the University of Wisconsin resides on traditional Patawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee uh, homelands along the southwest shores of Michigami, North America's largest system of fresh lakes, where the Milwaukee, Menominee, and Kinnikinnik rivers meet, and people of Wisconsin's sovereign Anishinaabe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, and Mohican nations remain present. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce the first panel. We represent Game World's research cluster in the Center, of, uh, Center for Data, Culture, and Society at the University of Edinburgh, connecting scholars working on games in both practice and theory across various disciplines. First, we have Dr. Tom Boylston, lecturer in social anthropology, with research interests in play, psychotherapy, and addiction, presenting a paper titled Intriguing Dopamine Subjects. So, over to you, Tom. Hi, everyone. Uh, do give me a shout if you can't hear me or see, see the slides I'm currently showing. Um, this paper comes from pretty early stage research around the contested concept and experiences of video game addiction um, and comes from sort of work on internet forums and with internet communities, noticing that people talk about dopamine a whole lot um, and wondering what this implies for broader notions of selfhood. Um, so dopamine is a neurotransmitter and neurohormone, uh, pretty fascinating and incredibly complex. It's involved in reward, learning and motivation, but also in general movement and motricity. It's involved in lactation, uh, various kind of homeostatic functions. Um, but the concern of this paper is about how neuroscientific work on dopamine has filtered through to popular discourses, particularly among users of video games and those who, in particular, who uh, consider themselves to be struggling with addiction or excessive use. Um, in short, the, the game addiction idea has been contested for the last couple of decades, really, but was finally officially classified by the WHO in the, in the name of gaming disorder in 2018 with with significant scholarly addition particularly coming out of game studies but also from psychology and other areas um, who questioned the idea on the grounds both of the evidence base but also the a feeling that the connection between uh video games and substance use was being made uh, too easily and without attention to the the complexity of the actual data uh, there's been a bunch of work in social science and game studies that has problematized the notion of addiction here, pointed out how addiction concepts are often maybe point to something desirable, or even a term that's used critically and in nuanced ways by players that, that don't map at all onto the formal medical concept of addiction based around time of usage, uh, ideas of tolerance and withdrawal and so forth. But certainly there are there are a wide number of people out there having issues or who would like to play games less than they do or consider themselves to have be having life changing problems. And there are important ethical and political questions about the intentional design of addictiveness in software platforms, uh, which have been followed up by scholars like uh, Kishana Gray and Wanju Huang. Uh, who pointed to uh, the rise of endless content, but also the increasing imbrication of games within wider social platforms that that sort of deepen the connections and the draws towards playing. Um, and by Felton Carlson, who has done probably more work than anyone in trying to trace uh, relationships between excessive play and the incentive structures of video games, um, in his case, focusing on World of Warcraft. Um, so all I, I don't require to you to accept the uh, the concept of game addiction as it's floated in public and debated in Parliament, but merely that something's going on, um, that there are numerous self-help communities across the internet, um, as well as uh, increasingly professional clinics focusing on game addiction, um, and that users within these communities talk about dopamine a whole lot, uh, and that it's become central, I would argue, to their self-understandings and the way that people describe their relationships to technology. 
So Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick, um, in her article pointing out the epidemic of addiction attribution, uh, pointing out how in the United States in the 90s, everything had become potentially an addiction from shopping to work to exercise to everything else. Uh, points to the kind of the liberal subject of the will, which is both supposed to follow its desires and to consume, but also to exert will in order to limit those desires, describes how that that self governing will is constantly vanishing in the face of ever more uh, practices that are construed to be addictive. And in this quote here, she says, you know, as everything becomes addictive, the locus of addictiveness can't be the substance itself, and can scarcely even be the body, but must be some overarching abstraction that governs the narrative relationships between them. So the abstraction that governs addictive relationships between the subject and the thing being used. And the argument of this paper is basically that dopamine has filled this slot. It's become the conceptual abstraction that links the subject with an environment that is construed as increasingly addictive. There has been endless media discussion about dopamine and design and the rise of behavioral design. The most famous proponents being Nir Eyal um, from the book Hooked, which he's kind of walked back from a bit recently with his later books. Uh, BJ Fogg of the Standard Design Lab and many others and the rise of what's called data behaviorism, which seems to use big data to revive a sort of Skinnerian behaviorist view of the subject. Um, this is largely come to prominence, but both through the public relations efforts of people like AL and Fogg themselves, but also through high profile tech whistleblowers like Sean Parker, uh, Tristram Hunter, formerly employed in Facebook, who have claimed that um, social media platforms were essentially deliberately designed using neuroscience of dopamine, uh, with the idea of producing addictive products in mind. And there's debate following on from that about how effective we should think of these, whether these are making slightly grandiose promises. Um, I should point out both this, all of this discourse simplifies the action of dopamine down to the reward mechanism. Um, and that that's part of the process I'm interested in how this very complex neurohormone becomes a figure for a certain kind of desire and reward. Um, and secondly, to point out, most of this work is is the work that's really filtering through is by a Cambridge neuroscientist called Wolfram Schultz, who has been particularly focused on reward mechanisms. So there's some key points, but but what I want to say is that this discussion about dopamine has not just come into design worlds, but has filtered through so widely to users that um, I, I found myself talking to a taxi driver in Glasgow who had had experience with gambling addiction, who said, oh, yeah, I, it's the dopamine. No. Um, this this idea of dopamine comes up in uh, Chinese communities uh, uh, focused on gaming addiction, and it's all over the uh, user focused communities on the Internet where people circulate uh, psychological and neuroscience materials trying to understand and find ways to manage uh, their experiences. Key points coming out of the neuroscience, uh, both for designers and users, were that dopamine uh, focuses more on anticipation than on pleasure itself. It, it can be seen as a pleasure molecule, but it's nothing to do with pleasure. It's much more to do with just reward, reinforcement, anticipation. That random rewards seem to produce more dopamine uh, than predictable ones, and that status affirmation can act as much as a reward as can more obvious rewards like food, sex or drugs. Uh, hence the like button on Facebook that, that was theorized through dopamine. I'd also point out that nobody here is measuring dopamine levels. These are what I call a hormone heuristic, uh, where ideas about desire that could be derived in other ways are theorized through hormones such as dopamine in a way to see them as granular and as a molecule that can be kind of titrated and tinkered with separately from the subject as a whole. So the popular uptake, you may have heard about dopamine fasting, the idea that you should take time away from all devices and excessive stimulation in order to reset your brain circuits. Um, there's what I would call paraclinical practices following Dana Greenfield of uh, those trying to reduce their gaming, uh, trying to th come up with dopamine based theories of how to recover. Uh, these are interesting to me because they often involve like pretty simple stuff like going for a walk and having social relationships with people. They are they, but they involve kinds of non-consumption and they're theorized through the same 
psychological literature that influenced the design of social gaming platforms. Uh, people talk a lot about uh, picking up the dopamine pipe again in terms of when they've been trying to quit video games and have had a relapse. They talk about dopamine hits the dopamine pipe. They describe this uh, as exactly akin to the use of, uh, of drugs. So what this means when you think about addiction through dopamine is that any addictive sub any substance or behavior is taken to be interchangeable. Uh, games make it particularly obvious because of the ways their incentive structures are built uh, and the ways that replayability is designed into them. But uh, you start to move towards a world where, as Sedgwick pointed out, anything is potentially addictive, even abstinence, even things like exercise, insofar as they produce dopamine, which is involved in all learning and motivation processes, um, have this risk in them. So the subject becomes one who is constantly desiring, but also constantly in need of discipline and self-regulation. Sean Parker, the Facebook whistleblower said, we are all dopamine addicts. And this is this idea of the dopamine addict is something I see throughout my research where the object of addiction is no longer a subject, uh, is no longer a substance or a behavior. It is the addiction itself because dopamine is, is the mechanism of addiction and desire. So addiction no longer has an object. It's just a runaway feedback loop um, in a sort of newly cybernetic field of desire and usage. Um, and I, I, I'm not going to give you firm conclusions on what that means, but that seems to me particularly important in this new way of thinking about desire. The other thing I want to get across is that dopamine thinking and dopamine design is usually something we critique. It's create, related to these big social media platforms, these narratives about manipulation of the subject. But in the hands of users, it seems to me that dopamine thinking has potentially a kind of critical edge where thinking about your experience of excessive use and desire in terms of dopamine leads you towards kinds of non-consumption, kinds of walking away from the space of consumption, away also from medicalized notions of addiction. Uh, this doesn't really fit with standard models of, uh, of withdrawal and relapse or anything else. It's much more an idea of addiction as something inherently connected to natural processes of learning, motivation and reinforcement. So I'd just like to sort of stick with the dopamine narrative a bit rather than critiquing it as yet another kind of biomedicalization of the human subject. I think there's something slightly more interesting going on here. Uh, we can get a bit of insight into that um, through the aesthetics of dopamine, the sheer number of dopamine tattoos that people have now. Um, and, and in thinking about why this molecule alongside serotonin, which often accompanies it in these tattoos, would be aestheticized seems to suggest to me a subject that is simultaneously rational and emotional, that, that identifies closely with their desires and emotions, but feels a need to manage them in a scientific, objective and infrasubjective way. They're managing the parts of themselves as part of producing a subject that is rational, but not in a way that is freed from uh, emotional influence. And there are all sorts of examples from other areas of game designs in which Hormone heuristics like oxytocin or adrenaline are used to try and design certain kinds of experiences where we're seeing this sort of molecular design where rather than thinking of an overarching experience, designers are trying to induce certain feelings through thinking what will produce oxytocin, for example. What do we know about the neuroscience of oxytocin? And how can we mobilize that to make you feel warm and fuzzy in a game? So there's a tendency to see emotion in granular terms that can be managed at a granular level, often as witnessed through data. Um, but addiction debates have always reflected a contradiction under capitalism between the imperative to consume and the stigma against the bad consumer or this insufficiently controlled consumer. Uh, people often talk in terms of the image of a Skinner box uh, in which we're always pressing the reward button. But part of the debate around Skinner boxes themselves in, in addiction studies has been you need to think about the environment. It's less about the reward lever than the box in which you put the rats so they're not able to go somewhere else and pursue more interesting kinds of rewards. Suggesting to me that we need to think about the game addiction debate in wider environmental terms, in terms of the quality of stimulus relationship and learning available to people. I'm interested in that the dopamine subject is a split subject where your desire is not your own. You're not the master in your own house, but desire is something separate to you that pulls you in the wrong direction, subject to manipulation. It's not the deep subject of psychoanalysis, but it is nonetheless 
sort of complex and split and it seems to me deserving of further investigation as well as being in need of self-regulation which seems to be a big theme of the moment um, and finally as Sedgwick points us rather than think about addiction in which this free will is constantly receding into the background in the face of ever increasing addictions can we think about habits the way the connection between habit and habitat the way we habituate ourselves to certain repeated actions and the way those repeated actions create a kind of lived environment um, and what the question i'd like to leave you with is whether we can sort of think with dopamine thinking in terms of the way it points us to a connection between desire and more fundamental forms of learning and motivation in order to produce critiques that, that will be relevant for platform studies and game studies across the next sort of decade or so. Um, I hope that fitted roughly within the time. As I say, this, this is very much sort of suggestive and hoping to throw open some conversation, but thanks for listening. And thanks to all the folks in Milwaukee for hosting us so kindly. Thank you, Tom, for that fascinating paper. Hmm, what is desire? That's the big question. You still have 30 seconds. Great timekeeping. Okay, moving on. Our next speaker is Dr. Jules Rawlinson, a senior lecturer in digital design, working across interactive audiovisual experiences, sound design, and digital composition and performance. That's recent creative projects exploring corpus-based aesthetics of transformation. Today, presenting a paper titled Composing Space, Immersion, and Interaction in a large scale virtual audiovisual installation. So, over to you, Jules. Thanks, Merlin. I think you should all be able to see my slides now. Uh, so, uh, X Coax, um, by the way. So, um, X Coax is the uh, uh, Conference on Communication, as uh, Computation, Aesthetics, and X. And, um, and so, that's a really interesting way to think about the various things that I'm going to tell you about now. Uh, so, just a, a very quick intro. I run the um, Game Sound uh, courses here at Edinburgh College of Art at the University of Edinburgh. And um, but my take on this is, um, while we do think about sound in games, is also we think about how we might use game engines and um, specifically game audio middleware for building artistic experiences as well. So. Um, experience. Um, essentially an audiovisual composition or installation. I'm going to use that word composition quite loosely in that it's something that the user has to put together. So essentially it's exploring themes of indeterminate composition um, and uh, there's, a, there's some examples that I'm going to give of some of those things there. Um, also as using this term installation is that it is a virtual installation that these things don't exist in real life. Uh, it is something that can only be experienced through a screen, either through a computer screen, uh, but also have built it as a um, VR experience as well. So, um, yeah, so first person experience intended to be, what can I do with these tools that I can't do in real life and why? So um, a large part of my research is in the performance practice of electronic music and composition. And so essentially this is a study around um, the performance practice of virtual installations. It's a photorealist installation um, and uh, an audio realist as well in that it's, it's, it's kind of dealing with quite a, um, uh, there's a representational aspect of it, of saying this, you really are in this space and people certainly in the VR uh, version of it, you know, do really think, wow, this, this is quite um, uh, convincing as a space. And then ideas around, and specifically then these ideas of space, which I need to define a bit. So procedural space, essentially the space is generated um, through algorithms and that there are a range of algorithms that are a function of space as well. So um, essentially I'm using X and Y to organize space in particular ways. The, and also to allow me to drive through particular parameters in the experience as well. 
They also then orchestrated space is how sounds are arranged in space um, through either their timbre, um, so essentially their tone color, and things to do with register as well. And then these ideas then of playful space, mediated space, essentially that you're getting uh, sensory input from the space and that you make proactive responses to the space uh, as well. I think the next slide should be a walkthrough. And um, what I've realized I need to do is to um, uh, probably stop sharing and turn on use the sound as well. So I'm just going to just uh, stop that for a moment and, um, and come back. Um, sorry, because I forgot to hit include the sound. There we go. Uh, so what you don't really get from that as a space is the fact that it's it's really very large. It's about 500 meters square in real life, and um, so the um, that's one of the drivers for this is that one of the things that I'm able to do in this kind of an environment is to um, create a, a, an installation at scale that you would not be able to um, to generally stage in real life because it's five soccer pitches large um, uh, in terms of scale. Um, there's a number of motivations here. Uh, the first thing being actually that um, uh, I'm quite closely aligned with the range of the digital humanities people here at Edinburgh and in particular research collections. And so building something interactive from archival material, something that would be playfully immersive. It's a walking simulator then built with Unity and Wise and it brings these uh, sounds, images, and interactions together at a scale. So as I've said, 500 meters square. Um, the images themselves are at least three meters tall in real life. They're, they're quite large. Um, so inside of a headset, you really get a sense of how large this space is. And ideas then of this mediated space are that the sound itself is a transmitter of space. The user is a receiver of space that together you end up um, negotiating your way through this environment. And there's a range of interpolations that happen both in the user and in the environment as well. So the various features um, just uh, that the I'm working with. Um, machine learning and um, transformations, uh, AI transformations using StyleGAN of images of musical instruments. You'll see some in a moment. These things create imperfect simulacra. Um, part of what I'm doing is working with various synthesis systems developed at Edinburgh Uni to try to imagine what these simulacra then sound like. Uh, there's various features that follow the audio um, in terms of how smeared and distorted um, the images are and how smeared and distorted the sound is as a result um, inside of there. So here's some of these images then. Um, basically, uh, Edinburgh Uni has a very large collection of historical brass instruments. They're very wild. The brass instruments themselves are a range of mediated spaces. And um, these are some of the outputs from the StyleGAN. But it is an iterative um, process as well. That Essentially, I was generating images, feeding those back in to the model to, to really amplify the distortions even more um, than, uh, than you might otherwise get. So something working with Abrams instruments there. Um, also other tools that kind of range around feedback. So um, the space itself is, is a feedback space. So I've mentioned some of these inspirations. Uh, there's some listed here. Um, so key ideas though are around spatial orchestration, open sonic form, 
um, harmonic and timbral ambiguity uh, that, that in terms of the, the way the instruments function, the way the sounds function, things to do with depth and dimension, staging and presence, and so on. So we'll see some of these things. So Havenstock Ramati interpolation, this is uh, an open score. Essentially, it's fragments of musical parts that people play in any order. Uh, Gruppen by Stockhausen, uh, which is three simultaneous orchestras and the audience sit in the middle of this so again there's a kind of a mediation that happens there um, in terms of you trying to unpack and um, unpick the, the the various sounds that are coming at you from three sides uh, Cornelia Parker in particular the idea that you have to walk around her artworks to fully experience them from a range of different perspectives including her work with um, uh, crushed brass instruments here, a uh, range of things here. Kathy Hind, um, who's uh, um, a UK artist, sound artist, dealing with uh, staging and presence, often of quite physical examples. This was actually in our fire station here at uh, Edinburgh College of Art, Shilpa Gupta. And um, this, the microphones that you can see hanging down here are actually speakers. So this was about the closest that I came to of an example of um, very many speakers in space, but there are not that many. Uh, Samson Young and um, Refik Anadol as well, to kind of dealing with the stage of things and themes of transformation. There's a range of presence causing form variables here. I'm not going to really get into them too much because we're interested in the space itself, but um, they're listed there. And it's to do often with how many things are in here, um, what the features of dimensionality are and, and, and colour, um, and how we experience the space as well. Uh, okay, so here's some screenshots then. You've already seen the, the walkthrough of it as a space. Um, but just in terms of the rigour of developing it, uh, as I was going, I tried a range of other things. And, and the, the darkness as a mediated feature, mediating feature, is a really important part of this. The fact that you can't really see much beyond um, maybe 10 or 15 meters in real space and that you have to because it is a maze um, of sorts you're constantly trying to make out where where am I where can I go and there's these clusters and pockets of open space almost like walking through a wood um, and uh, that if as soon as you remove that darkness it you, the whole thing just falls apart as an experience um, which was quite interesting so um, there's a range of features in this then um, that deal with th this large number. So when I say a large number, there's about 500 of these canvases hanging in space. They're double-sided. There's um, uh, a number of other exhibits in there as well. There's no single view uh, of or point of audition um, uh, in any of these things. Uh, and it is a comprehensible labyrinth. Eventually, you can make um, sense of it, uh, which is a term from Fencott. I'm going to talk about his ideas about perceptual opportunities here in that how he deals with ideas of attractors, connectors and retainers in virtual environments, things that essentially grab your attention and say, come to this place Th or things in environments that, that are able to say, well, now you're in this place. Why don't you go to this other place? And here's the path through to doing that or something that simply wants you to stay in that place for a while as well the other key idea of then mediated space is that it's a navigable space which comes from manovich the idea that there is per perception and motion through this space uh, on the left what you can see is actually a map of the space with these kind of clusters and pathways i've used a Perlin noise distribution to uh, generate these uh, clusters and holes and what that means then is it gives a forced spatial interaction that you ha you can't walk straight through the canvases you have to walk around them um, and that leads to ideas of ergodic musicking, which is a term from uh, Oliver, uh, which comes from the idea of ergodic literature, um, which is a fairly well-known kind of gaming um, uh, term, I guess. Um, so in terms of narratology, the, the idea that there is effort expended in trying to traverse this landscape of sound and music. Um, the, in terms of how that's realized uh, as this mediated space is actually to do with differing levels of perception of the audio. 
So attached to each of the uh, canvases is a very highly localized audio emitter that's appropriate to the image itself. I'll show how that's uh, done. Um, but they are a varying dynamic character and, um, and, and type of sound as well. So essentially, as you're moving around this space, you create your own kinetic structure in that the sounds themselves are moving because sounds moving is what happens through time. Um, but um, they're also moving in space as well as a result of, of you moving. They require participative effort and you as a user construct the experience um, with it. There are quite subtle audio effects as you move around the space in terms of Doppler effects, granulation, um, kind of odd delays and so on that, that again lead to it being quite a playful space. Just to give a view about this appropriate thing, once I generated the images using, um, using uh, artificial intelligence, I then had to use machine learning to categorize the sounds into a grid, allowing me to attach the right kind of sound back to these newly generated images again. But don't care about that. It's just some screen of code that says, when the player stops moving, stop the sound. Um, associated with these highly localized uh, emitters then and so by highly localized about three meters you can hear the sound uh, which is not very far at all are these very large overhead instruments of brass instruments um, they're highly saturated super saturated significantly larger than life um, and that unlike the um, the varying stability of these uh, very localized sounds these things are very stable sounds and they transmit for a really long way about 250 meters so about half the the environment um, but I've organized the um, instruments such that you get the, a very um, uh, orchestrated timbral sense so flutes have a very pure tone a saxophone is very raucous so let's put those things together so you get something that's raucous and pure at the same time and you're splitting up the resonant um, the register uh, the pitch in those kinds of things as well and you can actually start to navigate using these sounds that carry quite far this gives you a sense of where these things are, how they also point at each other as well. So you can actually use the space. I often look up and say, all oh, right, I'm underneath the trombone. And so the fastest way for me to get to somewhere is now to follow the trombone to a particular place. Um, some images from my WISE project. Uh, nobody cares about these things right now. Um, that's good so, 15 minutes, just you know. OK, that's great. I'm nearly there. Um, the the the. There are some things in there that are out of place, though, that act as um, switches and filters. They trigger different states in the experience, so that as you um, uh, uh, as you trigger these things, the whole or the the character of the of the work uh, changes. So um, yes, just to sum up, um, essentially there are these things to do in here with visual staging. Um, the structured and random use of sound in here as well, because there's hundreds of sounds in there. Um, and uh, it actually it rebuilds itself anew each time you play it. Um, there's these motion and proximity based mechanics that lead to uh, uh, a mediated space. I've had some nice feedback around it. And um, yeah, some, some key. Um, I think points to uh, to come out of this around how uh, we can use uh, agency and presence in virtual environments for um, s quite self-consciously artistic um, artworks and um, that's the end thank you fantastic you can do the clapping even if it's just be clapping fantastic work fascinating also really interesting deconstructions and reconstructions of sound we might talk a bit about labyrinths, but moving on, our next speaker is Yu Jing Wang, doctoral student in social anthropology, working on ethnographic study of the changing values surrounding gaming in Shenzhen, uh, presenting from Shanghai today. This talk will be a paper titled Gaming Online But Alone, the Ethics of Indifference Among Chinese Casual Games. So over, you to, over to you, Yu Jing. Thank you, Merlin. Hi everyone, I'm Yao Chun Wang and I'm a second year PhD student 
studying social anthropology at the University of Edinburgh. So currently I'm uh, conducting the field work in Shanghai and soon will be in Shenzhen as well. So what I'm going to pre present today uh, mainly consists of my recent findings, but it's, you know, it's still paper in progress. So it has been believed that online games have power to connect people. Playing with others seems a sweet chance to socialize with friends and even random gamers. Many ethnographies either pay attention to in-game communities like Guild or observe how the social relations established in games are transferable to the real life. In both situations, what, what we have what, what have been overlooked are disassociation, evasion, at a time when people playing online but alone. So in my ongoing field work with adult gamers in China, I find what happens during the time of gaming alone is nothing trivial. In fact, many gamers spend a considerable of their time playing on their own, even though they do occasionally play with friends. Play with friends. By foregrounding solitude in online games, this and this ethnography about gamers can also be taken as an opportunity for us to rethink the concept of connection and community at the time when online is becoming a basic way of living. So that it seems too, so that it seems too private to approach. Studying gaming alone also brings a methodological challenge in which only plenty of individuals can be directly, loca directly located. In the face of such challenges, I find the ethical aspect of gaming worth our consideration. In recent years, the idea of ethic in anthropology is concerned with not only collectiveness, but also individuality, not only as norms and standards, but also as affect and experience. In this presentation, I explored what I call the ethics of indifference among casual gamers. I, I refer to these gamers as casual gamers as how they often recognize themselves to be. They are casual, not only because they play, not because they play casual gamers, they play casual games. On the contrary, a huge portion of the daily gaming is intense and online, normally with the player versus player content. Most of them play a mobile type game named Honor of Kings, which, uh, which is one of the most popular mobile games in China today. In fact, casual points out their distant and frivolous attitude toward gaming. A popular phrase among them is just casual play. It dismisses the value of gaming and their attachment to it. It perfectly conveys the ethic of indifference, in my opinion. In daily practice, the ethic of indifference is also experienced by casual gamers and made visible when they negotiate other re uh, related issues like temporality. So, but first, why is the ethic of indifference? Among these casual gamers, the ethics, the ethics of indifference is represented by their efforts to describe gaming as so unimportant and worthless to them that it can be abandoned easily. The ethic of indifference is often expressed through the phrase just to catch a play, or in Chinese, or not taking the earnest, with, 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 with which these casual games seek to distance themselves from the activity of gaming. The ethic of indifference becomes explicitly visible through such things on diverse occasions. For example, Lee and Tintin were two roommates and both female gamers. When we first met, they claimed they were only casual gamers, but proving to me that they always look, they always take took care of other life matters first. According to them, they put a wider range of things ahead of playing games including work, exercise, housekeeping, as well as seeking romantic dates. Another example is once in a coffee shop, I chatted with a man while he was playing Honor of Kings. He seemed very frustrated by his, long, by his losing streak. When he was about to lose another match, he shrugged and mumbled to himself, thankfully, I'm just casually playing. In this case, he fully engaged in gaming and apparently effectively affected by it. But in the meanwhile, he was or appeared to be indifferent to the game. In both cases, it does not matter whether their words show their actual feelings or doings. Displaying indifference is always more crucial about presenting, them, 
pre presenting the self in front of others as well as in front, in front of themselves. Displaying one's indifference has grown to be an unconscious strategy to deal with moral concerns about video games. In China, the moral concern about video games has been closely connected to the public panic over internet addiction, Wang Yi, uh, that is usually the same as game addiction. Uh, gaming was compared to smoking opium, addictive and devastating. Historically, addictive drugs are not only believed to be the major threat to individual development, but also associate, associated with many social problems and the overall degeneration of the social orders that once led to the downfall of the Chinese nation from the 19th to 20th centuries. In this sense, it is more of a well-being rather than mental health that was prescribed for the individual amidst the panic over the internet addition in China over a decade ago. Although the moral concept about gaming is much alleviated nowadays, it has shaped the collective memory of gaming among a generation of young people at the time. Kevin, a male gamer with one child now, told me that his school days about 15 years ago were all about being a hardworking student and, and changing one's own fate. And part of that hard work was staying away from popular and online games. Nowadays, the ethic of indifference is accompanied by a typical, uh, a type of new re rhetoric about what may be considered risky, unethical, and thus must be managed for adult gamers. In this rhetoric, the focus is no longer on how much time, energy, or money is spent on games. It is the desire per se that is becoming the focus of the self-management. The powerful example is the distinction which my interlocutor Andrew made between him and his game addict, addict peers. In college, Andrew used to skip classes and play in internet cafes from time to time. But Andrew argued that he did so not because of his desire to play, but only because he disliked those classes and intended to do anything else. Gaming just happened to be the most convenient choice. But some of his classmates, according to him, skipped the classes only because they badly want to join a raid in game. And you said, addiction, or in Chinese, yin, is a lot connected to one's own heart. Xin, he argued that there's a xin under yin in the Chinese character, in the pattern of Chinese character. So, and he knew his heart is really loaded with the games. During the time I did my study with him and he worked as an internet cafe receptionist. Uh, he, he was still applying this moral reason to his daily play. When he sometimes prefer game and sleep in the, internet, in the same internet cafe instead of returning home during the eight hours between his two shifts. He insisted that his decision was made out of his aversion to commuting, to commuting rather than his desire to play. So in other words, as long as the desire to play is still manageable in the heart of the gamers, the engagement in online games is morally irreproachable for adults. Managing one's desire is, is trickier because if the only thing that needs to be managed is the, is the desire, it leaves some room for the individual to negotiate such ethical issues. In the story of casual gamers, display, displaying indifference precisely per performs the result of the minimalized desires so that the continuous inspection of one's own heart can be suspended. In this manner, being indifferent is to alleviate the moral concern and enable casual gamers play to play ethically. Then how does the ethic uh, make the casual game indifferent to sociality in the online world? Frequently, the casual gamers describe playing with friends as unrealistic because, first of all, it's difficult to find a suitable time for all participants. While there are explicit solutions to such difficulties, like making appointments with each other, it's barely an option for the casual gamers. This is because gaming is, first and foremost, an unplanned activity. In expanding the ethics, of indifference. I mentioned a tendency among casual gamers to deprioritize gaming. 
it means the casual gamer label their gaming moments as completely free time or the time without other things to do. However, these things are so ambiguous that it points not so much to the objective situations as their emotional states or the feeling, how they put it. In essence, being completely free and without other things to do are pseudo, are pseudo propositions that require no verification, but only feeling of necessity and the righteousness to play. And that feeling brings the casual game comfort and ease, particularly when they need to juggle gaming and other activities. When Kevin plays at home, this is exactly how the ethics of indifference is experienced. The first time I invited Kevin to, Kevin to team up in Isle of Kings, he told me he wouldn't stay online, online for, for, for long because he need to pause every once in a while. In fact, by pause, it means to deal with other matters, such as, such as replying messages, helping with housework, and attending to his child. Kevin framed this temporality as his own intermittent rhythm, or in Chinese, 断断续续的节奏, or rather casual rhythm, 节奏比较休闲. The, the most important thing is Kevin doesn't think that gaming in casual rhythm means his immersion in the game world is interrupted by banal matters. Quite the contrary. This is, this is exactly what makes him agile and comfortable as a husband and a father, as well as a casual gamer who play for the sake of the play. So in conclusion, through the lens of ethic, I wish this study shed the light on how the ethic of individual indifference help the, these casual gamers to navigate through the liminal space between problem gaming and proper pleasure, and how it prompts gaming alone at the same time. Although in recent years, some scholars argue that the moral concerns, concerns about video games has much reduced, it is important to be aware of that, aware of the very historic process where the ethic problem of the gaming are framed. Nevertheless, the ethics of indifference does not ask people to pretend. It is, it is not merely imposed on gamers from the outside, but, but largely experienced from the inside. But how exactly it works on this regard, it surely requires further study. In the case of online games, we say the human engagement in online game, gaming, in online activities is about connections, but also about these associations, where the public state of the online activities has interested many scholars. The, so the story of these casual gamers reminded us that how the private feeling of the individual is similarly meaningful. Thank you. My clap stands for all the claps. Fascinating, really interesting material. And yes, hmm, lots of themes starting to emerge about perhaps things like place of hmm, the reframing of discourses and control oh, i'm about to say that as well as ethics as well as affect okay i am now the last speaker in this panel so i'm going to share my screen and that while i do so i am dr marlon seller i am based here in edinburgh as well uh, lecturer in design screen cultures university of edinburgh where my research focuses on visuality with an interest in non-human and queer studies and often phenomenology and horror. These are the opening, opening lines of the game Control. It's like we live in a dark room and there's a poster on the wall. We stare at it and think that's the whole world, but the room's a cell. The world is much bigger and stranger. There's a hole hidden behind the poster. Quote Bogost, We've been living in a tiny prison of our own devising, one in which all that concerns us are the fleshy beings that are our kindred. And Seaver, sand is a tracer of all the movements, fast and slow, of the Earth's materials as they change their surroundings and produce the scenery of our lives. This paper reads the third person shooter, Control, 2019, Remedy, Entertainment, through cultural, historical, and new materialist lenses as a prison of sand, concerned with the strangeness of things. 
textual analysis will hopefully unpack the historical ontological interactions of concrete and its sandy substrate as an agentic haunting material. This is a game centered on a secretive federal bureau inhabiting an ineffably ancient and non-Euclidean structure called the oldest house and made from concrete. Where everyday items contain spatio-temporal powers and we fight a noise from another dimension that's possessed its office workers. So an average Thursday. Gravity's output has been largely ignored by scholarship so far. Uh, beyond some mentions of Max Payne's bullet time and quantum breaks transmediality, but represents uh, as a corpus, a sustained interest in supernatural thrillers set in, in the United States. Uh, and what Mark Fisher would call eerie, opaque agency interrupting the familiar. I use this case study as a cement mixer to aggregate things and theory, contributing to hopefully non-human uh, non -human turn and representational game studies, alongside my work in press on plants and stone in video games. I see this as part of a kind of wider plan project is what I call the stuff of games, uh, stuff that mediates play at the level of 3D props and environmental assets. The game concerned with the strangeness of things here speaks to the complex ambivalent infrastructural salience of sand as mediating materiality. Control is a big, rich, fecund game that encourages multiple contrasting readings Indeed, it supposes as its premise that all paranormal premises are true, basically. And I look forward to David's talk later. But from my perspective, it hooks us first with its eeriness, which Mark Fisher defines as a presence where there should be nothing or an absence where there should be something, typified by things such as animacy present in the inanimate or the sense of loss haunting ruins. I think control gives us both at once. First, the game's reception has been generally effusive, gushing, gran gushing forth granular descriptions that almost read like Latour's litanies of objects. All the things that are listed in this game are listed almost in the discourse surrounding it. At the same time, however, many note how dizzyingly hard it is to navigate its space. And indeed, destructible environments can make the frenetic possibility space really hard to parse. Much was made in the press of its early use of ray tracing, creating naturalistic surfaces through the hard to triangulate balancing of light through an environment. However, sticky frame rate is something multiple critics note keeps cropping up, often in the same breath and same language as frustration with the opacity of the game's narrative. This game seems to generate friction, sometimes pleasurable friction, but also interrupts flow at both the level of world building and hardware. What then might we make of this strange gritty materiality that has players interrupted, lost, and decentered? Game studies has been accused by Keogh Murray of marginalizing the visuality that fascinates journalists and players. And Bogast's orientation towards things and games is largely manifested in platform studies analysis of the substructure of games, the invisible things, things like Altus Studio, August himself, Robert, rather than games representation of things. However, as Keogh Murray and Annie will argue, games visuality offers powerful aesthetic, ideological, and embodied experiences. Visual surfaces are significant when code is predominantly encountered as visual assets. Moreover, surfaces mediate the world, and are thus more than superficial, I think, and as Anusas argues. Indeed, Cal Roger Calois' last book concerned the natural aesthetics of stone, of all things. It's non-human creative capacities. Indeed, a turn in his work, which he called the mysticism of matter. Here, I think we see this manifested in the oldest house. Affective surfaces provide the material for discussing the relationship of things, which manifest eerily as a texture of play, where the interiors of objects and code remain a little mysterious. Visually, control is fascinated with stony surfaces, from polished slabs to rough fluted walls, the physics-based rendering of materials and their deformation. Concrete chunks cleave and surfaces shimmer. Here the player character's telekinesis exemplifies the strange suffusion of play with materiality, with the ability to rip hunks of concrete into the air at the tap of a shoulder button, a strangely fluid but also distanced kind of spooky form of touch for the player video game cyborg. Indeed, we feel friction and texture audiovisual haptically as the object is dragged through the intervening materials and bodies before we plunge it back into the environment. 
as Bogost argues, it might be a bit arrogant to think we can fully grasp what an object, a non-human object, is. And it's productively world-shattering to realize how vast objects and relationships can be. The unfathomable history of an object or the scale of its kin can boggle the mind. And each attempt to penetrate the surface of an object generates new surfaces. If we can see the world in the grain of sand, it's also true, as Harmon says, that, quote, a pebble can destroy an empire if the emperor chokes at dinner, unquote. As Bennett has it, things can produce a gestalt shift in seeing how matter coheres and how matter matters, as Barrett would have it. But I think play is fundamentally concerned with mediating and changing our perception of what matters. I'm interested in a soft, what I call a soft, my soft version of object-oriented ontology, or OO, as it's called, the loose school of Harmon, Morton, at all, built on radically decentering anthropocentric worldviews by speculating on worldviews with non-human objects at their center. However, I disagree with some core premises. I dispute Harmon's idea of the coherence and the non-relative objectivity of, what, of objects, which is quite core to the thesis, um, mainly because, oh, after all, humans name these objects, we identify them, we just decide their limits in ways which presupposes our conclusions. But there are vast finitudes of relationships which we are unaware of and cannot access from our anthropocentric bubble without having to presuppose a kind of withdrawal or separate ineffable quality of the object that is unknown to any other object. They exist with faces which we will never see at the same time as their other faces. Things in control have powers that speak to these ineffable relationships and as much to be gained from troubling the hierarchy of subject and object. Bill Brown in his foundational thing theory describes uh, things as the latency and excessive character of objects. And I'm much more interested in thing theory as a frame and its ecological and political entanglements. Latour maintains that objects are mediators of energy rather than transparently and passively instrumental. As Daniel Miller argues, things make people as much as the other way around and we need not anthropocentrically reduce objects to subjects. For Brown, thingness is an uncanny potentiality that inheres in objects, somewhere between animacy and inanimacy. Thinking with the eerie, this is a failure of absence, a gestalt shift when something appears as if from nowhere. A concrete slab is a projectile in waiting. An expensive computer is always just an expensive paperweight, I think it's time. Stiegler argues, in our time of hyperindustrialism, we are experiencing the industrialization of all things. We have lost the individuality of self through the loss of individu the individuality of commodity objects that produce us. But Brown notes things' capacity to erupt as, quote, cracks in time's homogeneity, unquote, such as an encounter with an obsolete technology and control that suggests a different present was possible. Control is interested in the haunting strangeness of things. It's 1960s mise-en-scene of CRTs, typewriters, and Bakelite phones. Few are objects of power, which allow the player to feel out things and things like connections, like telekinetically roofing concrete from the fabric of buildings, which you can do at any time, anywhere. Uh, many more of these things are altered items that erupt with strange powers that resist us. But most are generic assets, which are no less lively. Set dressing exploding and deforming with captivating detail takes center stage, haunting us with their serial repetitions and catching us with their reflections and anachronisms. The Bureau operates to manage things, to contain it, but with the enemy infection, it regularly exceeds this contained. Yet the escape tunnel might be as dark as the prison. Obsolete malfunctioning objects become things, their material exposed by defamiliarization, like a broken tool, for example. Things are objects with their own strange agency, such as a mannequin that duplicates itself, a pram on the left that respires endless smoke, can't be stopped, and an old fridge that threatens violence if unobserved. Altered items then emblematize the hidden depths of everyday objects, like concrete. As Bennett captures what I think is the, what I think of as kind of the eeriness of things, quote, materiality is both too alien and too close for humans to see clearly, unquote. Breaking concrete free from its foundations lets us see a little bit of its eerie things. Rather than thinking, with the network of actor network theory or the highly individuated and sterile focus on objects uh, as somehow removed or ineffable in hard ooh, 
I prefer the metaphor of a kind of messy aggregate of things as a way of colliding these schemas. Sand is both granular and divisible, but also sticky and gritty. And sand is vague as an aggregate in an ontological sense, speaking to the impossibility of a unitary object. Who can say when a heap ends and the dune begins? So it combines perhaps something of the ineffable and the relational. Entanglement with controls metamorphic sand constitutes eerie aggregations in what Ivino and Opperman highlight as the vast networks of material agencies. Globally, we use 50 billion tons of sand per annum, binding it to make concrete and melting it to make silicon and glass. You might think of our age as a digital one, but we proliferate concrete and glass at incomprehensible rates, building the equivalent of eight New York cities every year. Easter and Seaver describe it as an elusive material that falls through our fingers, but is hardened into more than we realize. The sand economy constitutes a hyperobject in more than sense, a vast and pervasive mesh that defies rational understanding to the extent that we've produced enough concrete to cast the entire planet. And we live in a strange world where Saudi Arabia is worried about running out of usable sand. It has to do with the difference between beach sand and desert sand. As Brown argues, we become aware of things, the things of objects when they stop working for us or when they become momentarily visible in their own terms, exposing hidden relationships. Like when sand ceases to be a beach or a building and becomes stuck on our toes, or fragments flying and tessellating through the oldest house. The trace of a terrifying economy. Unlike the playful ephemerality of sand in sandcastles, or the fluid orientalist spills and slides of sand in journey, control foregrounds the socio-historical specificity of sand's technicity through brutalist concrete main ingredient of which is sand. When Forty argues that concrete is characterized by a strange ambivalence as ancient, modern, and synthesized natural, this speaks to both the disorienting temporality of sand that sediments and erodes in 200 million year cycles, and the recent nostalgia and Instagram aesthetics for failed brutalist utopias, as highlighted by Holleran and Mould. Rainer Bannum framed brutalism as an architecture of structural honesty and utilitarian monumentality, but many of these social housing structures proved hard to maintain and often labyrinthine, like these examples are quite confusing buildings to navigate. While in the late 1960s, public works concrete became associated with ugliness and authoritarianism, in recent years, brutalism has become a hauntologist specter of a possible egalitarian and anti-consumerist world. When our reality is one of entrapment in brutal networks of roads, silicon, and unregulated global markets. To quote Dushello, the 21st century promises freedom, uh, promises, mobi promises mobility without freedom, unquote, exemplified by the concrete motorway, whose rampant development and expansion displaces and, and displacements marks toxification and isolation as much as connection, while much of the welfare housing in the 60s is crumbling back into sand and ruin. Control here puts the strange ontology of sound-based materials into conversation with what Galloway calls neoliberalism's controlling systems of protocol and Deleuze terms societies of control, built on modulating bodies rather than containing them. The post-war West replaced hard power with the illusion of freedom, freedom to work anywhere and any time, but effectively everywhere and all the time, a network society of freedom without change. Deleuze's language, reminiscent of the dynamics of sound, transition we're experiencing is from prison to computer, but no less confining. Quote, Enclosures are molds, distinct castings, but controls are a modulation, like the self-deforming casting that will continuously change from one moment to the other. After the iron and stone prison comes the fluid prison of sand, but nevertheless, the sandy aggregate subtending the soft power of real world control still manifests as hard power regularly. The necropolitics of the rampant post 70s growth of the American concrete carceral state housing 20% of the world's prisoners and just 4% of the population by country. That's 2 million people. Eerily, eerily if we sometimes assume we live in a non-violent society, discipline still haunts societies of control. Concrete hasn't disappeared, it's just become too close to see. As we simultaneously juggle the in-game, flexible, neoliberal joint contract of janitorial assistant and director of the bureau in control, answering to the board, the player's movement through control space is fluid and halting as we weave around concrete, chasing close to our enemies to catch the health they drop, always seconds from possible death. 
um, after 15 minutes, I'm nearly there. With myriad objectives and zero waypoints, we regularly get lost in a neoliberal nightmare of infrastructure between bittersweet dreams of brutalism's discipline. The game of apparent edifice of disciplinary society controls endless offices are actually repeatedly broken with shifting walls, fractal concrete blocks, and distorting shaders. Vertiginous brutalist arenas are intercut with montages of impossible underground housing blocks. We must live in the house the sand built while it deforms itself around us. In the penultimate level, we are trapped in an interminable internship, fetching coffees, making copies, facing 21st century precarity, the loser would call limitless postponements of the society's control. Unquote. We don't win in control. Instead, we save a bureaucracy from itself in an endless job of crisis management. We are directed by the board and the building, interfacing with a network that controls us, a self deforming caste. When IGM's review notes that, quote, paranatural forces at work treat cement and rebar like Lego bricks, unquote, this is precisely the ecological and political crisis of life in neoliberal concrete capitalism. Like the metamorphic qualities of sand, power is both hard and soft, mobile and unyielding. Individual grains are translucent, but cumulatively opaque. To quote the board and the game, quote, we are there everywhere. We expect independence dependence, unquote. Video games connect players to strange silicon machines. As Anibal writes, they entangle us in a circuit of feeling between their computational systems and the broader systems to which they interface. Unquote. In control, this circuit is murky and haunted neoliberalism. Control's fictive assets are affective things, and through the whir, rumble, and particle effects of telekinetic sound, we feel our enmeshment in systems, but eerie ones, ones that we can't fully sense, ones that stick to us and wear us down. Sound might just be quartz, but as Cohen argues, stone can affect limit breaching intimacy. Its thingness offers us an eerie eruption of the too close to see. Thank you, and sorry for going over. Okay, that brings us to the end of the presentations. Now, the fun, the questions. So we have half an hour here for questions from the audience. And indeed, we might have some filtering in from Twitch, I believe, as well. Are there any immediate ones which occur to mind? You can raise your hand or pop them in a chat. Could be for individual panel members or the panel as a whole. Uh, yeah, if no one minds, I'm just going to jump right in. I, I enjoyed all the papers very, very much. Uh, ones that you know were closer and ones further away from from what I do. But uh, and I have several questions. But I wanted to start with Tom's paper, which I greatly enjoyed, having written about gambling for many years and knowing that you know it's a it's a it's a, a minefield to find a productive way to talk about addiction. Uh, with respect to games or addiction generally. So I, I found it very refreshing. I, and in particular, I, I was, I'm excited by the idea that you, you do this delicate dance, you know, between what we used to call the emic and the edict. You know, you, you want to treat this as an uh, emic phenomenon, the, the mobilization of this rhetoric of dopamine as social action that's worthy of our understanding, but without throwing out, you know, thereby sort of implying and, and jumping onto some kind of uh, ultra critical distance you know, that there's anything useful as a social fact going on, right? And I, I really appreciate that. My main question to you has to do with um, the theme of discipline and regulation that was going on in your talk, which I, I really thought was a very important dimension of, of what you're interested in. And of course, for me, that, that leads to some sort of deeper historical questions. So I'm curious, do you see that, that um, the link between the rhetoric of dopamine and and the and, and self regulation as tied to um, individual utterly individual notions of the self and and because there was that moment where you talked about how the Skinner box example very effectively how context right we have to uh, force ourselves almost as academics uh, to to attend to context right and another way of talking about that is maybe force ourselves to attend to talking about relationships and not just uh, individual selves. Um, so I'm, do you identify this as a kind of, uh, do, you, do you identify this language as part of the kind of threads of the deep threads of Lockean liberalism in, in Western thought? Thanks, thanks. Oh, there, there's loads in there. Um, I, I'm i wondering if, it, if it's a sort of uh, quite a deep challenge to the Lockean liberalism, um, mm. partly because when, when you, you almost jump over the individual subjects. You, you talk about dopamine and other hormones, 
and you talk about the technological network that is designed and incentivized in certain ways, often by the um, <clears throat> the validation you receive from other people through uh, social media feedback. So it's almost as if you jump straight from the no the network to the hormone, and that the self the self is this odd node between them. Um, so so yeah, and that that's and that indeed is why I'm trying to stick with this dopamine narrative a bit rather than just saying why it's yet another instantiation of neoliberal capitalism because there is some what what people continually come to uh in the paraclinical stuff and when when they're thinking through dopamine is um as you said that there, there's something here in social relationships that this is also something that comes up in uh personal relationships non-motivated relationships relationships that don't happen through an, an incentive structure whether they're face to face or not um so so i i can there there is there seems to be something fundamentally kind of interpersonal about it where where um and this this you know i'm personally a, you're influenced by attachment theory and bit, bits coming out of psychotherapy where when you start to think about emotions in terms of hormones you 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 go pretty quickly to attunement and the ways that attunement is learned through the presence of carers and the presence of social others. So, and, and that's, yeah, and so I guess I'm trying to suggest that this dopamine talk can maybe lead us in that way, in a way that kind of disturbs that, that simple narrative of self-managing self. And, and Right, and, and I, I think that's, that's great. I, I, yeah, I suppose another way, you know, this is going to betray my old fashioned training, but another way of talking about um, what you're observing as the kind of this popular dialectic is a kind of classic structure versus agency kind of struggle, right? And and you're trying to find a way to transcend that, right? Like it sounds like with an interest in habit and habitat, you want to talk about encumbered selves, not this simply. There's an either or here. Either there's there's a self that can manage to regulate this and stand in between uh, at, at take control of this node, or there's some structural uh, way the body works, the way our chemicals work, and the way capitalism works that uh, we're subject to, right? And you're trying to avoid both of those as easy answers. So I, I really appreciate that. Very good. Yeah, I'm I, I could also maybe just quickly draw a connection to Yao Jing's paper, uh, where, where you know, in in the Chinese situation, dopamine has has also been part of this intense moral debate about game addiction, where in fact you're seeing now. Uh, very tight regulation of, of social media and gaming platforms and limitations on youth play, where this is seen as a disciplinary issue, much much more in terms of an interventionist, developmental, quasi-socialist state. Absolutely. But, I, I love the framing in terms of ethics there. And I'd like to hear more about that. And, and there was, it's one of the few areas of the world where we actually have multiple decades of really good ethnographic work on game playing and gambling is China, uh, going back to, you know, whether it's expatriate communities in Alan Oxfeld or Hans Steinmüller stuff, and people like that. So, yeah, I'd be interested to hear from Yajing if you want to speak a bit more to, you know, what, what that trajectory looks like it's been and give us a bit more of that historical perspective as you see it, if, if that's something you can speak to. Yeah, it's about... 20 years ago, I mean, around 2008, that, at that time, I, 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 was a, I was a child, so, so the memory of the, uh, of the whole gametic addiction thing is, is, is so imp was so impressive. The, you know, the, uh, at the beginning, the, the, the online games was, was attacking the media as uh, a, a major cause of the, 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 the degeneration of the moral standard among teenagers and children. And but suddenly in 2012, around 2012, the, 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 the whole moral panic over gaming just reduced. And for, for years in the last decade, it seems to me that to, to many people that that, that that kind of moral concerns just disappeared. Uh, at, although they are, there were some, you know, episodically, uh, uh, official media attack on gaming or, or parents complaining about the gaming things. Uh, but in recent years, the, 
it just uh, it happens again that people begin to talk about more begin to talk about game addictions and the uh, and the bad influence of the gaming. So, uh, so basically, I observed that among adult gamers, uh, so they they were uh, mainly born after nineteen eighties or nineteen nineties, like me. Uh, they develop different strategies to uh, cope with such moral concerns, so so that they can play ethically. Uh, the one strategy is uh, so obvious that people think gaming is not, not a big deal; it's just a simple leisure activity, and you can enjoy whatever you want uh, as an adult. And it's just gaming; it's not not some bad habit like drug or uh, you know gambling. So uh, that's one way people deal with moral concerns. But on the contrary, in the opposite of this story, uh, and I think not, not many people notice that uh, some of us as, as casual gamers, they, they, they respond to the moral concerns in the indifferent way uh, to present the indif indifference to, to the game. And uh, that doesn't really reveal their actual engagement in, in games. Uh, so the most extreme case I observe in internet cafe is that uh, with a, a person staying in internet cafes for you know binge gaming about a week and didn't leave the internet cafe, but, but, but he say, said to me that he was a casual gamer because he was just you know, find a place, find a shelter, find a place to stay, and gaming is just the, you know, uh, a bonus, not the main purpose of his, uh, of his action, of his, um, uh, uh, of his life. So uh, that is a hard moment for me that uh, how people respond to the moral concerns about gaming is, is, is not necessarily like, uh, I, I accept it. It, uh, it can be uh, distance. They, they distance themselves from the gaming and say, I don't care about it. Uh, uh, I don't engage in game as you imagined. And uh, it can be a way to protect themselves. But for me, uh, at this, but you know, this is still work in progress. I think it's, it has some experience aspect. Uh, so yeah. I. That, that's the, the that. whole project of this thing yes i don't want to take up too much time with all the things i find fascinating but i'm just going to mention that um you know, michael hertzfeld uh and his ideas about the ethos of imprecision in greece uh there's uh, i think some strong connections for you and, and in general his ideas about cultural intimacy i also wrote a little bit i was mostly riffing off what he was talking about uh the way nonchalance is performed uh around gaming and uncertainty in greece so i think there's some we could talk i'd be happy to talk with you you know offline about some of those connections i think it's very exciting yeah that's great that's wonderful cool really reminds me of sam and gay's uh, ugly feelings thinking about subtle affects cool really fascinating discourses i see jules has raised your you raised your hand there would you like to intervene uh it's a question actually for yao jing and also um uh, directed i guess towards tom as well um about the I'm interested in in this kind of sense of disinvestment and um, and the the indifference towards uh, games and how that impacts then on the the dopamine aspect as well um, and and so I guess more directly towards Yao Jing in terms of the kinds of games that people are playing in the people that you're observing and. Um, uh, in terms of how indifferent you can be to it, um, that, that what kind of game uh, determines both the, the kind of the dopamine aspect of it and also then the, the indifference, the, the deception to the self and the disassociation uh, of it as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, the short version is how casual, what kinds of casual games are explicitly casual? Oh, well, that's a, that's a good question because uh, uh, some people say the mobile game is, I mean, for my interlocutors, they, they believe uh, mobile games is essentially, is essentially casual. 
because you can take it to everywhere. And, and especially when you compare this to some traditional role play games like the World of Warcraft. Uh, uh, but I think the standard of, uh, for them, the standard of the, of the casual, of casual is, is so flexible. Uh, as well as said in, in this paper, uh, it's more about how do, how do they present themselves and, and that contains how do they uh, conceive, how, how they conceive these, these games, like for, for, an inter, for the intellectual cabin, my intellectual cabin, uh, he play the World of Warcraft sometimes also uh, in his, his casual rhythm. So for him, he uh, can believe that World of Warcraft is a casual game. Uh, but for me, that is a whole. Lot, that's a lot of things. The the the, the world of Warcraft. It, it it requires a lot of immersive immersive uh, immersions, and apparently not casual to me. So I, I would say there's no absolute standard of of the casualness. Uh, so for for the second for for another question about dopamine, I, I don't really look into it. But uh, interesting is that one of my uh, Interlocutors did once mention the, the whole the theory of dopamine to me. Uh, so uh, it's about manic desires. So he said uh, basically uh, he wish he could stop when he thinks this the, uh, the this is the right time to do something else. Uh, and he was aware that it is dopamine that somehow trapped him in gaming activity. Uh, so that's that's all I know about dopamine. But I think, for uh, uh, to some extent, I think Tom is making powerful argument here. Dopamine is becoming uh, at least a kind of rhetoric narrative for gamers to manage their desire to play and their yeah you know, the, the to 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 conceive what uh, what kind of game is casual. So it's all about desire, and desire is now explained with dopamine. We have a couple of questions in the chat. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to flag, I'm treating this as shifting into our break. Hope people might be okay with the 15 minute break. Um, so we might continue until quarter two. I'm sorry, Tom, I don't know if you wanted to come in quickly there or we can move on, cool. I uh, guess Stuart has a question in the chat, which I'll just voice here. Uh, I very much appreciate the distinctive qualities you find in the game, but do you think um, the control might also participate in a family or species. I go back inevitably to Half-Life and Portal. Feels like control is part of an ongoing aesthetic process. Great question, Stuart. Yes, that's part of cut from the talk. Um, yeah, so think about Half-Life, the gravity gun stuff, also as one of the first games to involve photo textures. It has lots of concrete, which involves the scanning <laughs> of game of concrete, but also using kind of noise textures for that stuff. So there's a lot of interesting haptics that Valve does in their stuff. Their new technologies, their hardware. Uh, I'd yeah, throw I throw Death Stranding about... in on top of that too, uh, and you probably had it in your in your list. Death Stranding. Yeah, about humans subjected to apparatuses and time in different ways. <laughs> yeah, uh, indeed, also using lots of photogrammetry. Uh, I was thinking in particular about retro '60s aesthetics as being kind of cultural moment right now, or having a cultural moment right now. So for me, Death Loop, uh, Prey to a lesser extent, and We Have a Few. So the last six or so years. We've had sort of three major games which were revisiting a dark version of the 1960s. And I think this plays into a sense of um, probably saying that hauntologists lost the welfare state in both capitalist and uh, socialist spaces. And also, I think also the kind of Cold War nuclear fear, which has been resurgent not just in the last few months, but for a longer arc with Putin's turn to tactical nuclear weapons and stuff like this, uh, were in, as Roger Cowell puts it actually in his book, Writing, on the, Writing of Stones, uh, the fear that we might life might return itself to inanimate matter in ways which is quite scary. But yeah, I think we moved on from the retro 80s stuff. Now we're in the, the new past. Uh, we have another question down here from Matt. Uh, a question for Jules. Can you speak about your experience programming? Did you learn to use programming languages for this project? And how does knowing the code behind the VR space change your walkthrough? Good question. Uh, thanks. So, um, no, there were things that I had to learn um, for this project, 
uh, but actually I've been programming various um, object-oriented programming languages uh, for over 20 years. Um, this project is about two years old. Um, uh, I started, I guess, programming in C Sharp for Unity maybe six or seven years ago. Uh, uh, there is actually nothing in the game at all. There is n not a single... Um, if you open up the Unity project and you look at the scene, there is nothing in the scene. The entire scene is generated um, from a single script uh, in terms of an oriented, um, an object-oriented approach. Um, the uh, and that's something that uh, that yeah, it gives me a lot of flexibility. Uh, in terms of generating objects. There were various things that I had to do because I'm generating so many sounding objects um, that actually what happens is that there is a radius uh, that is um, controlling whether the objects are active or not in Unity's hierarchy um, so that I can manage um, all of the multiple channels and, uh, and the geometry at once, so beyond kind of clipping and, uh, and these kinds of things. So, um, the second question, though, about knowing the code behind the VR space and uh, changing the walkthrough. I think that once people, if I tell, some of the effects in there are perhaps overly subtle at the moment. And um, thinking about um, Merlin's paper and objects of power, uh, the, there are... I, I just right at the end, I started to talk about these these objects of power, and they act very similarly um, as they do in control. There was a, a, a battered trumpet sitting on a chair, and um, they're just a, there's a very few that are littered in the space that don't seem to fit. It's almost like somebody just left them behind, um, and that once people understand that's the mechanism then um, they start to get more out of the space. And, and one of the key things is that you have to be in the space for some time. If you're in there for, for three minutes, you're not going to get anything out of it. Um, if you're in there for 13 minutes, you, you probably will get something more out of it. If you're in there for 30 minutes, then you'll probably understand it as an experience. It's, it's a very durational experience. Um, one of the, the, the things about it working in VR is also though the and this perhaps comes into this sense of freedom the second question that somebody's added in here as well um compose something through moving through it is that the speed with which you move through it and your proximity to certain kinds of locations really affects your understanding of the space and some of the anecdotal evidence that i got was of somebody finding particular sweet spots um, that uh, they then just left the character in the space, um, let the audio play while they were doing another task, and, and let it go. And that there's a number of different timescales in the space, so that you're, even as you're moving, um, it, I've been quite profligate with how long some of the sounds are. Um, in that there are hundreds of sounds in there, it's quite a large download, because the sounds are actually quite long some of them about 30 seconds long which in audio terms is quite long um, uh, and there are gaps in them and so in terms of the audio files there's silences in there so if you're hearing two things that one of them's 30 seconds long and another one's 25 seconds long and they're looping then that already is 25 times 30 seconds um, in terms of th that looping you add another thing in there and you get something of another dimension altogether of um of the durational aspect of the work and so it's easy if you move very quickly through the space to miss some of the fine details in it um, both at the very close level the, the the kind of near distance so one of the things that i think about a lot is foreground middle ground and background but the point is in a mediated space what is the foreground can change 
because you have changed your own foreground. Um, and um, so, so there's that. Uh, and also, though, the, the final thing that is a mechanic in the space is that with the overhead instruments, uh, there's a switch in there that essentially the closer you are to them, the faster they start emitting sounds. Um, so that you get lots of overlapping notes um, and, uh, um, and these kinds of things. It becomes slightly more staccato. Uh, there could be more of a sense of dynamism in, in it. That's somebody, uh, that's somebody that has uh, told me that. Um, that essentially, if you, I quite often speed run through it. And um, that what I would like is something that, that uh, happens as a result of the speed with which you are walking um, or running through the space as well. Anyway, I'll stop uh, talking there. Thanks. Fascinating. And um, if I can interject just a few more questions in the chat there, I really was struck I, by the I kind of just, sorry, could I just make a, a connection back to Jules, which is it's interesting that it's interesting that you put in these erratic objects to be also mechanisms for state changes. Because for example, in other situations, like in, like in, um, in Halo uh, 1, when people are modding maps and they're using the special Halo coding language, they, they also do this thing where they, in order to have state changes or time durations like you're talking about, they'll have objects which they make sealed off from the players so they never see them, but they need to have them there so that they can sort of contain the, the the state changes just in the way that the, the objects are articulated. So interesting. That's really cool. And it brings, I guess, senses of um, well, the senses, the hidden and the seen, the felt. I was wondering if if you thought in your work, Jules, about I guess the haptic and about thinking about the way in which you talk about these durations, or duration creating viscosity in space. Uh, I'd originally thought maybe there were kind of points of, of membrane you kind of felt the pass through that the audio become a kind of textual field or mesh that you went through, it seems more as kind of this slick or slippery, really multifaceted kind of neo-baroque folded space to, uh, again, hand fists and Deleuze into the conversation. But yeah, the, the haptic. Hmm. Uh, the, uh, very quickly, um, one of the things, uh, because it is a VR space, um, one of the things that I added in there were some uh, very translucent characters almost ghosts of other people in the space and partly that helps uh, with the sense of presence um, that you're aware of your own scale here are some other characters um, uh, the very low poly um, very high um, opacity um, um, but you can't actually move through them you really get stuck up against them if you, if you do and so there is definitely that sense then of um uh yes of a viscosity of of that experience as you said and uh, of a haptic um, experience as well i think one of the things that is quite that is a concern um is that with certain of the sounds um they are quite visceral if you play them in terms of the sub bass, for example, in them, if you play them over a particular system. And that's one of the things that as a VR experience, I will never be able to do. Um, that I built a, an experience some years ago for Glenn Morangy, um, what they described as a sonic tasting. And, um, and they said, oh, we really want it to punch you in the stomach when you walk into this room. And I said, well, I can never do that because this is an experience for headphones. I can't physically make you feel it in your stomach unless we actually put a sub base, a sub a woofer in the room. So um, uh, anyway, that, that's just a, a thing there about the haptics thing. Things like, again, um, getting the controllers to vibrate um, and, uh, and those kinds of mechanisms would be um, something to explore, I think. And I hope I haven't submerged, and that's a really interesting question about, I guess, the way in which objects can store potentials or kind of global stage anchors kind of in the field there. It was quite interesting, I noticed you you played around with disguising elements of the play space, of course, with darkness, and deciding that permeability that depth is really quite interesting. Uh, and I wonder, hmm, to my mind, it would be quite interesting if you'd see a far-reaching sense of a near infinity to the space, but I guess your labyrinth metaphor there, I think, is quite interesting, the sense of, uh, of enclosure. So I guess it's technically a multi-cursal maze, uh, if I was to be pedantic about kinds of maze. We have a comment slash question perhaps in the chat here from Stuart. Marvelous intersection of perspectives and discourses in the session. Ah, just a general thanks, it seems. Um, <laughs> don't anyone mention the brown tone, which is a reference I'm not going to get. I'm sorry. 
Ooh, if there aren't any other questions, or are there some? Oh, it seems Thomas has one. Ooh, do you have one, Tom? I think you're muted still. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Uh, there to find that mute cover. Uh, so uh, this is from Merlin, um, and, and I'm going to apologize because uh, I have only the barest sliver of, and I, I'm just enough to be very dangerous of uh, knowledge of, about architecture. Uh, you know, my, my brother is a, is a very uh, sort of scholarly architect type, but I really enjoyed the paper, and as I was hearing it, I was thinking about some of those modernist comments about concrete as a material. And I think you began touching on them, but uh, am I right in understanding that uh, you know you you mentioned that there was a position, I guess it was the modernist position, maybe the brutalist position, that this is an honest material, right? And but what I had heard from my brother is that is a critique of concrete as a fundamentally dishonest material because it doesn't uh, and and steel maybe even more so, right? But certain certain modern uh, components of uh, of modern architecture because they don't express how they do what they do, right, to people who go through them. And, and I found myself thinking about that because of this notion of eeriness, right? Is there a way in which the capabilities of modern construction materials is, is part of the, I mean, I, I think you touched on this with sand, but part of what makes them eerie is the way in which we, are, we don't intuit um, how they do what they do, structurally speaking. Yeah, mm, there's lots in there. Yeah, Le Corbusier, of course, called it raw concrete, but there's no real such thing. I guess there are actually technically natural deposits of hardened concrete to aggregate. But yeah, like all these assumptions, assumptions that it would be an eternal material, whereas now we're hitting kind of hard limits. Um, I think the Biden administration's already given up plans about replacing brutalist uh, infrastructures across the US. Um, but yeah, I'm thinking about it. So we live in a kind of weird mixed space where you have, yeah, lots of new kinds of material and I kind of return to kind of the Baroque in different ways, uh, in terms of facade, in terms of surface. And um, people like Jarno Bohm writes about, about this through the lens of atmospherics, which I'm quite interested in saying, we talk about staged materiality. So things like veneers, um, things like using semi transparencies and, and lighting to kind of create the feeling of sumptuous materials from cheap materials or vice versa. Um, and the way in which like, we of course phenomenally feel these things and they might as well be real. And, Kind of powerful ways but create this kind of interesting orchestrated atmospheric kind of space versus all this practical kind of functionalist architecture that's still being mass produced well to say functional some of these very spaghetti junctions seem quite <laughs> more aesthetic than functional but this sort of like the bare concrete is still present and manifest across the globe as well it's also differentiated i made a focus there on on the states but of course very different kind of legacies in different countries think about remedies on context in Finland, where technically the welfare state came in quite a lot later in the late 60s. So it was kind of a slightly different relationship to concrete there, different against Sweden, and of course, global south, and different ways in which those interactions happened. We think about like Abuzia going to India, and the way in which that was a weird kind of mixture of a, a kind of creating a city there, which was both very bespoke and fine-tuned down to the chairs, as well as involving kinds of these mass concrete complexes. So yeah, there are lots of complex interactions here uh, <laughs> in ways in which I'm also tempted to say like concrete was always kind of, yeah, always doing this kind of strange ineffable eerie work back then and now and the discourse has shifted in some ways, but also it's still doubled and split in the way that people talk about it. Well, I think there's a lot to learn from it, you know, because I think there's an analogical relationship between steel and uh, rebar, uh, concrete and code, right? In terms of the way they, they they produce the infrastructures of these spaces that we take to be natural uh, spaces. All right, ask me. Indeed, I'm, I'm very keen on the, the sand becomes both silicon and becomes concrete right. in ways which were, are both kind of hidden, opaque and messy in dark mm -hmm. ways. Cool. Jules. Uh, thanks, yeah, it's actually a, um, a reflection um, around the stuff of games and um, and relating to the concrete which is that um there is a musician and um a composer called curtis rhodes um who in the world of computer music is is very influential and he talks about micro sound and essentially um it's, this is sound that uh, barely exists beyond a click and that you're kind of building things up from particles um 
into things. And so it made me think about the idea of the stuff of games, and particularly given that you're thinking about concrete here, as micro stuff, meso stuff, and macro stuff. Um, uh, in the, the roads, take this idea of micro sound, meso sound, and m macro sound. Um, uh, was a, a, an interesting thing. And I just wondered then um, a, about uh, your sense of how micro stuff, meso stuff and macro stuff uh, might be reflected inside of control. Mm, granularity. Well, I'm interested in greens, uh, sound greens. I talked a bit about the way we shouldn't often talk about that. The sound in Journey is weirdly sparkly. That's only speech sound. Does it sound? Wouldn't be ordinary. Uh, but yeah, hmm. the ways in which we could think about also the ways in which uh, the coding level as well, looping, the way in which game designers build up loops in various sort of scaling ways. I was very struck in Tom's paper about a sense in which dopamine subjects talk about the loop or utilizing the loop and the kind of micro loop as a way of escaping subjectivity or yeah, bypassing the self in kind of powerful ways. Um, yeah, hmm. the control I think does this through lots of different ways. There's the symbolic order of these altered items and it has like the generic and mass produced sort of items around about it. So it has material which I think objects which are hidden within other things. So there's a kind of like a potential infinite granularity of the concrete. So when I say you can summon concrete from anywhere, I mean anywhere, it just it will find some concrete around you and pull it out. Quite often it means literally deforming a bit of architecture in ways which you can see. But sometimes it just conjures it from nowhere so you can create different objects. Um, but I feel I'm, I'm taking up all the space now and we're just one or two, mm, we're at the quarter, we're at the quarter two mark right now. Are there any last final points or questions before I let you all go to have a hot drink of your endemic to your, your time zone? No? In that case, I think it's a wrap, folks. Thank you to our panelists and thank you to our hosts. This has been really fun and really enjoyable. And we will be back in 15 minutes at five o'clock for the second half. Okay, thanks, folks. See you in a bit.
PhD candidate in English, Ryan House, titled Circuits of Diegesis, Flows of Agency and Waves of Return, Remediated Structures of Thought and the Author Interface. So go ahead and take it away, Ryan. All right, thanks very much, Thomas. Can everyone hear me just fine? Fantastic. All right, and are you seeing my screen yet? Um, there we go, hopefully that's right. All right. Um, first, thank you uh, to all the, the speakers from this morning. All of the panels were fantastic, and I just, I, I couldn't keep up with all of the connections that I felt like they were making with the ideas that I have for this paper. Uh, but I hope, uh, you know, I hope they, they come to your mind too as I'm reading this. Uh, I want to thank, uh, in particular, uh, a big shout out to Matthew Kretcher for putting this together on the uh, UWM side uh, as part of the Serious Play team. Um, he's sort of been the, the driving force behind this, but it's been a team effort. So thanks everyone from Serious Play and Game Worlds Collective. Um, okay, so my, my, my paper has this big long title that uh, I hope we make some sense of, uh, but I'm particularly interested in the idea of remediating the idea, the concept of the author and um, sort of updating it maybe for, for um, you know, our world of participatory media. Uh, as Thomas mentioned, I'm a PhD candidate in English. My background is in the humanities, uh, but in the course of the PhD program, I stumbled into some social anthropology uh, through Series Play and Thomas and, and the folks that I work with in there. Uh, and I really feel like the, the, that work sort of refracts my textual, uh, rhetorical and historical uh, lenses that I see things through. Um, and in particular, that you know, just sort of learning that in their field, they sort of have to champion the text of the game itself. And in, you know, in the humanities, it's always like, no, remember, there's also play going on. Remember everybody, it's not just a book. Uh, so sort of seeing those two ends meet was a really sort of brain fold for me. Uh, and I try to work that through my, uh, my work going forward. Speaking of that, this work comes from something I wrote before. I was uh, right after I graduated with the MA actually. So I think it came out in 2016, but I think, that I, think I wrote it in 2014 or something. So it's, it's old. Um, and I was, I, it's, I, I, I never, I didn't feel like I quite said the thing that I was trying to say there. Um, and rereading it, I can really sort of feel myself getting close to this idea, but I never really, I'm not very good at sort of um, pinning it down on the page. Uh, so what I'm wanting to do in this is, is maybe walk through it again and introduce some ideas that I've thought uh, since then. And maybe, um, you know, just reconciling a little bit of this old idea with some new ideas. So uh, I'm, I, I, the original problem I'm, I'm, I'm trying to tackle here is to somehow reconcile two concepts of the author uh, that I see popular culture sort of uh, uh, you know, uh, displaying as illustrative of the independent game maker. Uh, and particularly things like Indie Game the movie, we can see Phil Fish here being, uh, you, you know, uh, suitably wacky for this sort of uh, crazy uh, experimental genius or whatever figure. Um, and it really seems sort of like there is this uh, binary, right? The gatekeepers of meaning, this, this, this rock star genius auteur, uh, you know, we could think Kojima or Miyamoto or even, you know, uh, somebody like Goichi Suda, maybe. Um, and then on the other side, this invisible facilitator of the meaning making process. And, uh, you know, this one's a little bit harder to name, but I'm thinking things like maybe Sid Meier. He's a, a star, of course, but we don't think of him as like, maybe not like aesthetically a, a tourist, but uh, more in the ways that his uh, simulations sort of sell themselves as being a, a particular way. Um, Paginov, maybe the, the, the inventor of Tetris, you know? Um, I, I, I don't think anybody can deny that Tetris is clearly sort of a, a, a shining example of game design, but no one really thinks, ah, yes, the, the eye of Paginov, right? Um, so, this is where I'm at. I'm wanting to get at particularly how video games, I'm, I'm, I, most of the sources that I'm, that I'm bringing up, and that's not true, some of the sources I'm bringing up um, refer to games in general. Uh, and I think for the most part, that also applies to video games. But there's also things about video games that don't apply 
that aren't backwards compatible to games at large. And I'm interested in sort of getting at that and how that figures into this idea of the, um, the author interface or the author presence in a video game. I'm building on ideas of authorship and literariness for that matter, uh, as considerations of art from uh, French thinker Roland Barthes, famous for the death of the author, of course, uh, which was essentially a hot take of its time, uh, calling criticism aimed at author intention, boring and lazy, and ultimately the role of the author is in shaping possible interpretations. Um, in his work, uh, S. Z, I, that's probably probably supposed to say that in a different way, but what have you. Uh, he sketches out readerly versus writerly text, right? Think about something like a stereo manual versus gravity's rainbows. Reader, readerly texts uh, are designed to push out meaning directly from the author. Um, and I think a lot of realist texts did this, uh, you know, at the turn of the 20th century um, versus the writerly texts that produce a plurality of possible meanings. Uh, he says to interpret a text is not to give it a meaning, but to appreciate what plural constitutes it. And reading through SZ, which was written either in the late 60s or the early 70s, I can't remember off the top of my head, um, he almost seems to conceive of modern video games in this sort of uh, plural texts where you can jump in at the beginning, middle, end, and everywhere. At the very least, hypertexts. Next, I turn to Alexander Galloway's work on the interface effect, in which he takes the claim, in which he makes the claim that interfaces aren't, sorry, that interfaces aren't things, but they are processes that produce a result of whatever kind. So, um, you know, of course, we think of interfaces as being the screen, the keyboard, the monitor, but instead he's, he's wanting to push our understanding a little bit further and think of it as an amalgamation of those things that produce a process. Um, to illustrate this, he uses two pieces of visual art, Rockwell's triple self-portrait and the Mad Magazine parody of it. In the first pick, we see Rockwell sitting in front of a portrait in progress, his back to the viewer as he gazes into a mirror, which is reflected back out to the observer. Notice how these three self-portraits create a closed circuit as the viewer's eyes move toward the paint between the painter, the reflection, and the painting, notice simil noticing similarities and differences between the three. For instance, in the reflection, Rockwell's gaze is obscured by his gloss cut over glasses and his pipe sags in con concentration, yet on the canvas, face enlarged twofold, his pipe juts out confidently and his eyes, sans glasses, address the viewer. These juxtaposed depictions provide a sort of foothold for making sense of it, for coming to some conclusion about authenticity uh, in representations, for instance. In the mad image, the artist still sits with his back to the viewer, but this time his reflection peers out to address the observer, and the portrait on the canvas faces inward, presented to the viewer as if from the viewer's own perspective of the back of the artist's head. It's a great sight gag, but as, a vis as, but as visual information, it puts all of the onus of making meaning of it on the viewer to get them to fill in the spaces left open by these incongruent edges. There's nothing but inconsistency here as we try to make sense of it. There's no logical sense. Galloway notes, quote, the stress here is that one must always think about the image as a process rather than as a set of discrete immutable items, end quote. Uh, essentially, he's making a claim, and this is a very sort of microwave down, uh, that a work's composition, particularly in the way that it is, it is um, disclosed, in the way it discloses itself to the, to the viewer, to the audience, uh, affects a sort of prescriptive frame, and that this, that this occurs processually and continually. It's not finished once, you know, the, the piece is finished. So in my original piece, I use Davy Reed and Stanley Parable and the Beginner's Guide as a way to try to uh, show the way that this that I see this working in those two games. Uh, the Stanley Parable, I say, is very similar to the Rockwell painting, whereas the, the, the Beginner's Guide is closer to the mad parody of it. Uh, just a quick summary of the Stanley Parable. 
and I've, I've actually gotten really good at this. And this is a really short summary of a very uh, obtuse and hard to put in a box game. The Stanley Parable, a narrator navigates players as Stanley through a surreal story in an office building. Players have lots of opportunities to do something else to the narrator's chagrin. Uh, multiple endings, but each ultimately conclude with the player beginning the game again back in Stanley's office. The end is never the end, is never the end, is never the end, which is a recurring uh, sort of ticker you see on the uh, loading screens as the game uh, sort of switches back over to the start of the game. All of its edges, even the weirder ones, flow back to its center, a flow of return, which uh, again pushes out to all edges that, that return back to the beginning. Uh, and it's, you know, sort of, um, I, I, I think of it as waves because it's very rhythmic, uh, particularly in the beginner's guide. Juxtap juxtaposition is the key machination here in the meaning making process and the interface of the thing, the way it operates to be interacted with, uh, supports that to a degree. This is a very, very writerly text, Barthes would say. Uh, the beginner's guide is a little different. Uh, it presents itself as a straightforward linear story narrated by Davy, a fictionalized version of Reedon who serves as the game's autobiogra autobiographical narrator. The game is comprised of a collection of previously unreleased games made by an estranged acquaintance of Davy's whom he calls Coda. The goal of the game, Davy tells players, is to get to know Coda by playing the games that he's made, hinting that there's a unifying theme in all of the seemingly desperate games, and that if players look hard enough, everything will become clear. However, players soon enough discover that Davy has been making changes to the games all along. Sorry, I meant to say spoiler alert. Uh, usually in an attempt to provide cohesiveness or to create symbolism. And that this is actually the source of the strain on his relationship with Code in the first place. The game ends with an ashamed, remorseful Davy. I put little uh, scare quotes in there because who knows. Uh, hoping to reconnect with Coda. So on its surface, the beginner's gut is very similar to the Stanley Parable. It's a first person walking sim. Uh, narrated by a disembodied voice that leads players to the game spaces, but this is where the similarities seem to end. This game is linear, and players are relegated to a more cinematic mode of engagement. That is, players are extra diegetic agents. They're not part of the story. They're just there sort of uh, as ghosts, um, whose sole responsibility is to receive the narrative information. They have no surrogate, a la Stanley, through which to enact any agency in the game. This game lacks the door on the right. There are no opportunities for a player to break away from the narrative as it's presented. If the Stanley Parable is an open house for players to peruse at their leisure, then the Beginner's Guide is a regimented guided tour that a player either follows to the end or departs from prematurely, but can not alter. Or at least this is how it initially presents itself as a readerly text through which meaning is dispensed. Like the mad portrait, every ounce of energy within it is aimed at its own externalization. And that's a quote from Galloway uh, at the end there. End quote. However, my argument here is that Reedon's implementation of a stronger authorial tone in the Beginner's Guide does not repress the interpretive potential of the game, but rather facilitates that plurality of meaning uh, indicative of the writerly text. The game's anti-ludic design elements and Reedon's metaliptic inclusion of himself as the narr narrator of the game are just ways in, or just some of the ways in which the game positions player into a particular mode of interaction with it, what Catherine Hales would call deep attention. Uh, thoughtful, reflective, meditative even. Uh, a way of being that one perhaps inhibits when being a good listener. Uh, and importantly, this thing is a participatory, participatory process that is never stable and is still nonetheless prescriptive to some degree. What a takeaway from this, and, and what I wasn't, I don't think very successful in getting away, getting across in the first article, was that this kind of verbal or discurs discursive mode, uh, what I'm calling the author interface, within video games can affect the procedural modes just as they are affected by them. Okay, I think I'm running short on time, but I just, I'm almost done. So one of the new pieces that, I'm, uh, that, I'm, that I've encountered recently, and this one just sort of explodes all over my work, I, I keep coming back to it, is uh, Cetai Nguyen's uh, Games Agency as Art. I should have put the cover on here. Uh, but he writes about games as artifacts with which we are able to inscribe forms of uh, forms and expressions of agencies. To start with, I want to note that he is talking about particular games. He actually starts with a with a with a, a, a sort of analysis of uh, Bernard Suits' analysis of games. 
Uh, and it's, you know, widely known that Bernard Suits is particularly narrow in his scope of what he considers games. But that doesn't mean that it's not completely useless uh, because he's very good at describing those types of games. What Wynn does is uses Suits ideas of uh, striving play. Uh, or maybe it's achievement play. I can't remember, but he splits them into striving and achievement. Uh, and for for when basically what that does is to illustrate the ways that games allow us to um, split our goals and our motivations, uh, showing that we are sort of you know agentially uh, uh, flexible in what we can strive for. Uh, in striving games, we strive to play. In achievement games, we strive to win. So something like gambling would be, of course, achievement. You're not necessarily going to let uh, someone else sort of catch up with you just for the sake of keeping the game going and having fun. Um, what Nguyen is particularly interested in is the aesthetic striving game, games that derive their aesthetic pleasure from the, 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 the playing of it, the striving of it. And uh, importantly, he notes that in games like this, the artist's work, the rules, the architecture for play, and the attentive focus, the player's own actions are separate. Um, and that's that's pretty uh, rare for, for, for works of art, right? Typically, when you make a painting, the attentive, the, 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 the attentive focus is the painting that you have created. Um, maybe not necessarily The actions of the eyes of the of the person you know viewing the painting although who knows um all right i think we're about at time so okay just want to quickly wrap up sure yeah let me push through um essentially this is the idea that that the games are a medium of of agency and the game designers are are essentially working with agencies uh to produce aesthetic results uh, remediating, the, remediating the author, a concept that acknowledges both the participatory, participatory nature of the text as well as, as its careful composition. Um, I am starting to think more uh, about the author interface as a verbal semiotic mode of video games that attempts to create alternate, alternating flows of localization, the Rockwell's painting, and externalization, the mad parody, within the meaning-making process. So this sort of switch between uh, you figure it out and I'm telling you. Um, and, and that aligns with Hale's uh, oscillation between a deep and hyper attention to in the beginner sky Davies narration is perhaps an obvious interest instance of the semiotic authorial presence for our undertaking of the procedural elements of the game uh, operating as a prescriptive frame for our under undertaking of the procedural elements of the game uh, specifically uh, the way that reading configures the experience so that Davies seems to do us a favor by unlocking the gate or speeding the stairs up these moments highlight the dual nature of video game authorship the semiotic and procedural and illustrate how the relationship functions for a video game. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Ryan. Um, great, let's move on to our second paper today. This is from Joey Lara, and the title is Unstable Ground Substrate Use as a Rehabilitation Tool Impacts on Chimpanzee Positional Behavior in a Sanctuary Setting. And just while Joey gets set up here, I just want to mention we're going to hold questions for the end of these papers. Oh, wait, let me get to the beginning. All right. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to be talking about. Uh, giving an overview of the thesis topic that I'm going to be carrying out uh, the project on this summer uh, on introducing a compliant unstable substrate into a chimpanzee enclosure. Uh, All right, so like many other animals, chimpanzees don't do very well in captivity, uh, especially under captive settings with worse living conditions. Uh, they can exhibit repetitive, stereotypic, and stress-related behaviors that signal uh, kind of mental torment. Uh, these can include self-directed uh, scratching, hitting, biting, poking one's own eye, pulling out their own hair, uh, all kinds of stuff leading to uh, self-injury that requires medical attention. And they can also pace, rock back and forth, and manipulate and eat their own uh, 
feces, uh, among other problems. Um, one of the major overarching reasons for the lower welfare in captivity is because of the difference between captive habitats and the historic habitats of chimpanzees. So in the wild, they can have home ranges between 2,000 and 5,000 acres, uh, usually with a lot of different types of climbable plant substrates of different and ever-changing compositions, diameters of branches, branch flexibilities, and branch orientations. Chimpanzees have evolved to effectively navigate and move throughout a complex three-dimensional environment. They also employ uh, complex foraging and hunting strategies to obtain some of the more difficult food, food seed. In captivity, they can be confined to small spaces with less complexity and less usable 3D space. The enclosures tend to lack the thin elastic compliant branches that chimpanzees use in the wild, and climbing substrates tend to be more uniform and rigid with some hanging ropes and swings that are uh, overrepresented compared to in their natural habitat. Uh, most captive environments fail to provide the conditions for appropriate species typical locomotion, postures, and mobility. Um, but of course, captivity is a broad category and can encompass different types and qualities of zoos, as well as pet cages, uh, laboratories, and sanctuaries. Um, the study population that I'm going to be looking at will be at Chimp Haven, the federal sanctuary for retired uh, chimpanzees in Keithville, Louisiana. Most of these chimps have been retired from biomedical research laboratories, and a lot have been infected with different human diseases. Uh, and these chimps are housed in groups of around 11 individuals and given relatively large naturalistic areas to inhabit uh, that have lots of trees and grasses, as well as artificial climbing structures and termite mounds. And they have 24 seven access to outdoor and indoor enclosures. Um, so this is the kind of I, one of the most ideal places for chimpanzees to end up after being retired uh, from harsher captive settings. Although the goal uh, can only be approached, uh, management of these chimpanzee tries to realize and work towards providing as much of the benefits to chimpanzee welfare that exists in their natural habitats as possible. One of the major ways to infer welfare in, uh, in captive apes is by examining their activity budgets, uh, including uh, locomotion, postures, and mobility, which can be uh, click, uh, yeah. Uh, greater ability and ease of engaging in uh, different positional behaviors uh, has been found to correlate negatively with stress-related and stereotypical behaviors, uh, either by uh, the lower mobility causing uh, depression, uh, depressed and uh, stress conditions, or from negative emotional conditions leading to lower mobility. Uh, it's thought that efforts to increase mobility can help to improve overall physical and emotional well-being in the chimpanzees by ameliorating their pain, requiring less energy demand for performing physical actions and giving them more control over their lives and their ability to affect change on themselves and their positions in their environment. Uh, so can, as you can imagine, being confined to small spaces without much room uh, can really limit their uh, climbing ability and mobility over time. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the chimpanzees at Chimp Haven that were tortured at and later rescued from biomedical laboratories had never been outside or seen a tree before arriving at the sanctuary. Uh, on top of this, Chimp, Chimp Haven is a non-breeding facility, so the population skews older, um, and a lot of the, them were rescued when they were older as well, um, so they can have uh, problems like arthritis, uh, suffered strokes, or just generally take longer to heal from injuries. So here's where I think play comes in. Uh, learning in mammals often involves play behaviors. Uh, under normal chimpanzee development, individuals gain their locomotion and posture abilities by engaging in locomotor play. Um, Locomotor play involves, usually involves cycles where an indi individual engages in self-handicapping followed by performing an action with that handicap uh, uh, in place uh, or by regaining full function in order to perform the action. Uh, the self-handicapping can occur by limiting one's musculoskeletal uh, functioning, by inducing sensory impairments, and by entering unusual positions and orientations. What this can look like is an individual can relax particular muscles leading to a loss of balance, and then the animal tries to regain uh, 
a controlled posture despite the, that disadvantage. The individual may also spin in circles or shake their head for a period of time in order to create vertigo, or they might close their eyes while performing uh, an action. And this limits their sensory functions for a time while they continue to try to perform their intended action. Juveniles also employ different types of substrates during locomotor play, particularly those that are more compliant and prone, prone to deforming when a chimpanzee tries to climb on it. Utilizing these substrates can encompass uh, the handicapping phase since they, uh, they can cause the animal to lose their balance, particularly when manipulated in purposefully uncontrolled ways. I've got a couple of videos here, um, but these um, alternations between states of self-handicapping and recovery have been theorized to help an individual train for uh, unexpected events. Ideal locomotion is not always possible, and there are a lot of things that can interfere with normal movements and sensory functions. By putting themselves in disadvantageous and unbalanced positions, they're solidifying their ability to function against or in spite of unforeseen events that throw ideal movements out of order. Uh, this also uh, gives the animal better control of their bodies generally and better spatial awareness to interact effectively with their environment. Uh, it's also especially important for apes like chimpanzees who engage in many types of movements in a complex environment where branches might break, distances might be misjudged, uh, some, an individual might slip, uh, conspecifics might attack, or any number of threats can emerge. In this way, juveniles train their ability to recover from falls that can happen in trees or deal with losses of balance, control, and sensory abilities that occur when being attacked by group members and uh, when quickly changing directions while being chased. So these all confer major uh, survival advantages. Play behavior in chimpanzees becomes less common as individuals age and shifts, um, we go, and shifts to uh, focus more on the social play aspect rather than locomotor play in order to build relationships and navigate social situations. Uh, adults rarely play with few exceptions. Uh, Adults rescued from very poor living conditions have been reported to engage in more solitary play behaviors and uh, captive chimpanzees have been found to uh, engage in play for longer periods of their development compared to uh, wild uh, chimpanzees. So I think uh, that these atypical play behaviors can be related to the, uh, that are related to the living conditions do not um, they, hold on, uh, yeah, so they, they can be related to the living condition because, uh, worse conditions lack the ability to, to promote, uh, the learning and skill development that they are evolutionarily programmed to seek. Uh, but, um, in general, there, there's a reason that learning and gaining uh, physical acrobatic and locomotor skills occurs by engaging with the flux in one's environment and the flux in one's position and uh, contact with their environment. So many effective physical therapy exercises make use of similar principles to regain strength and mobility. Uh, these may involve uh, body exercises that are difficult to maintain or move in certain positions where flexibility and muscle strength uh, increase to compensate for the difficulty. Uh, the use of resistance bands uh, similarly requires real-time stabilization and other uh, exercises uh, can involve different substrates. Uh, for example, the rebound therapy is where uh, patients are instructed to perform exercises on a trampoline uh, or while up on an exercise ball on the trampoline, attempts to maintain or regain control and stability while on this unstable substrate have been shown to increase balance, spatial awareness, and mobility in individuals with spinal cord injuries, stroke victims, and people with severe intellectual impairments. Furthermore, uh, there have been observable increases in quality of life scores in people with severe intellectual impairments who undergo rebound therapy. Uh, similar results are seen when patients perform exercises in pools of water uh, because the added and unexpected uh, resistance to certain movements in the water encourages transitional muscle development. And physical therapists also uh, prescribe exercises using foam pads that make it difficult for patients to balance while performing the exercises. Um, so, 
So some of the some physical therapy programs have been tried with chimpanzees. One recent study uh, had chimpanzees with physical impediments to their mobility, uh, particularly ones related to eight uh, related to aging, engaged in uh, they're trained to do certain postures uh, for a food reward. Uh, I have a picture on the on the right there of a chimpanzee training with the resistance band because they have um, an injury in their hand and. There are also other exercises where they train them to do squats and uh, things like that and change how they're uh, hanging on things. And those, the results of the study were very promising and showed that uh, they had increased mobility and decreased impediments to their movements, but also uh, reduced uh, stereotypic and stress-related behaviors. Um, so I would add not only um, is physical therapy a useful tool for recovering from injuries, uh, but it's also good as a preventative measure against injuries, um, particularly against uh, more vulnerable pop populations of, of animals that are older. Um, I believe it's also the case that utilizing the different, different substrates, um, particularly compliant ones that are more responsive to an animal's actions, and require more mobility to, to use can allow for increased mobility uh, in general, just by the total amount in their environment of uh, different types of substrates. Um, so that's why in this project, I wanna introduce a more compliant substrate uh, into the mix of their environments. Uh, so the project will uh, kind of draw from both theories relating to locomotor play and physical uh, human physical therapies. So I'll build an unstable compliant substrate um, that's basically a big water bladder um, made out of uh, fused sheets of plastic filled with water and then covered with uh, fabric and uh, tarp and with a foam, foam underneath to protect it. Uh, but also uh, the foam will make it so they're never contacting with a hard surface and the water will uh, make it more difficult to balance as the water sloshes around the thing and they try to balance on top of it. So I'll record uh, data for two weeks before introducing it. And then um, for four weeks while it's present and then for the additional two weeks after removing it. Um, so I'll collect data on the activity budgets um, and uh, including the different uh, locomotor modes and positional modes that they and that they go in uh, during the study. And um, I'll also be measuring the mobility uh, in a new um, method that I'm developing, which will be based on uh, separating the amount total amount of time that they're moving between gait locomotion, which are the repetitive or cyclical kinds of motions on one substrate versus the uh, non-gait locomotions, which is everything else basically. Uh, and that the reason behind that is that it would seem to be uh, more difficult for older individuals to do those transitions between different things. All right. So yeah, I hope to find that the that the, this uh, substrate uh, creates better uh, living conditions for them and individuals who use it more will end up with greater increases to their mobility. Um, and I hope that this can uh, highlight the importance of uh, including and uh, considering uh, unstable and compliant substrates as well as just general physical properties of the substrates in their environment uh, in order to increase their uh, overall well-being, including their mental and emotional health. Um, and I uh, hope that this will also allow them to engage in general, not just when on the substrate, but uh, in their climbing and everything uh, with more species typical locomotion, uh, which will uh, is beneficial for all kinds of reasons, including potential uh, reintroduction efforts that uh, are more successful when, with species typical behavior. And um, yeah, uh, in conclusion, chimpanzees, like many other animals, have been subject to a high degree of anthropogenic uh, disturbance, 
both in their natural habitats and when brought into human captivity uh, with horrific effects. Um, we should uh, do what we can to maximize their quality of life, which for chimpanzees especially should place special emphasis on the use of different substrates because of chimpanzees' uh, natural variety in locomotor and positional behaviors. Uh, I believe we can draw from the unified functions of locomotor play during typical chimpanzee development and uh, that of physical therapy techniques in humans in order to create environmental designs that can promote greater well being in the chimpanzees. Thank you, Joey. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now we will move to our third paper of this session. Um, this is from PhD in English candidate David Kutchik. I neglected to mention Joey Lara is a master's student in anthropology here at UW Milwaukee. Um, David Kutchik, uh, the Bureau Game Needs You Resonances Between and Through Objects in Remedy Entertainment's Control. control. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, I will need access to share my screen, unfortunately, before I can get started. <laughs> Thank you. That is that is happening as we speak. That, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, all right, let me just make sure I'm in the correct mode so you don't see all my notes. Um, okay, here we go. So I am, it's, Merlin's presentation is going to be a hard act to follow, but I will do my best um, to do so. So um, what I'll be presenting about today, um, is, like Thomas said, I'll be talking about resonances between and through objects in Remedy Entertainment's control. And so what I'm going to be um, talking about is um, a specific subset of, of objects within the game called Objects of Power which we'll get to in a second, um, and how it relates to concepts about mediation, particularly a concept called post-human relationism. But first, before we get started, just for those of you who are, um, aren't sure or, or don't know much about control, um, control um, was- David, oh, David yes. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna mention, we are yeah. seeing all of your notes and everything. <gasps> oh no, just, thank just you for problem. letting me know. So I wanted to make sure you had a chance to get thank that you. differently configured. Let's try, oh, there we are, I think you're set. There we go. It's not, it's not a symposium online unless something weird happens. Um, it just jumped back. Okay, we, you know what? Briefly, I, I'll just yeah, ignore my go. notes. There okay. we go. Um, yeah, so anyway, so Control was was made in, uh, published in 2019 by Remedy Entertainment, um, and it centers on the character of Jesse Faden, who through a series of otherworldly and paranatural events, um, becomes the director of the Federal Bureau of Control, which is in, in the games world, a uh, branch of the government of the United States um, that is specifically investigating paranatural um, activities um, in all forms. Um, uh, when she becomes the director of this Federal Bureau of Control, she is directed to eliminate the hiss, which is an evil resonance that takes over uh, the oldest house in which the game occurs, um, kind of infecting human bodies and also human-made objects within the game. Um, and we also have uh, uh, Jesse guided by some paranatural entity called Polaris, which is uh, heavily hinted to be a resonance similar to the Hiss, but which is slightly different. And so we have several resonances within the game, and I, I kind of want to explore this concept of resonance and how it relates to um, ideas and theories of mediation. So what I'm relating this to um, is an article um, I, I read through last semester, um, as, as well as kind of building off some other work in OOT. Um, so the, the theory that I'm going to be talking about today is post-human relationism. I'm not particularly gung-ho about the term, but more about the ideas behind it. Um, so Nora Campbell, Stephen Dunn, and Paul Ennis kind of develop and, and explain this term in their um, response to a book by Harmon, which is called Immaterialisms, um, which was published in 2017. Um, and within this article, they argue that um, in order to apply ideas about um, speculative realism, um, object-oriented ontology, um, or other new materialisms um, in order to apply it to social theory. Um, 
basically they're arguing it's potentially impossible to know what objects are outside of the social, outside of human perception. And so they're um, arguing against certain um, strands of arguments within these uh, theories like OOT and speculative realism that uh, posit what objects do before human perception comes in. Um, and they're really, really emphasizing here that objects come about into the social. And so, like I mentioned, they build on Harmon's OOT. And in, in materialisms, um, Harmon actually coins the term object-oriented social theory, um, which, but, they are, but uh, Campbell et al. are really arguing that when Harmon talks about this social theory, he's more so talking about objects within themselves rather than, quote, the association between things, right? He's more concerned about objects, how they exist and how they develop into something that can be socially recognized. What, uh, what post-human relationism is saying is that basically we can't really know what they do before they are socially recognized or received by humans. Um, and so they, they uh, contend that relations between humans and non-humans um, in kind of all forms, at, uh, specifically in objects, but, but also basically anything essentially non-human, these relations between them, the perceptions of them are fundamentally unstable, shifting, impossible to like codify into something that's like ontologically stable um, in a way in which we can perceive them in some way um, or define them in some way as stable before human perception. And so taking this theory um, to some of the resonances within the game, um, like I mentioned before, we have the hiss, which is kind of this evil entity, if we want to call it that, um, evil in the human perception of the word, but we don't really know what the entity's intentions are. Um, but the hiss uh, is an infection. It, it, it invades human bodies. Um, it possesses them. There's very creepy parts where they're like floating up in the sky and like chanting something. Um, and you see them all throughout. And the hiss also um, possesses specific paranatural objects, which we'll get to in a second. We also have Polaris as, as a, a residence who offers guidance for Jesse, who, who leads them through the house. Um, and like I mentioned, the hiss also um, resonate with or infect or possess um, specific uh, items called objects of power and altered items. Um, I'll briefly explain what objects of power are. I know for those of you who have been attending that Merlin also went through this a little bit, um, but I'll, I'll give a brief recap. So. Objects of power, as they are defined in the game, they're defined as quote unquote archetypal objects, um, which are imbued with paranatural powers. So um, these are things like um, a jukebox, uh, um, a TV set, an x ray machine, a telephone, right? These kind of archetypal objects that have, that are like basically fundamentally perceived by a large community as like something that has a particular use, that has a particular function. And these objects of power have been kind of imbued uh, with paranatural powers somehow. Again, the process for how these particular objects get imbued with paranatural powers is not exactly known um, by either the player or by the people within the game. But for some reason, there are very specific objects like one telephone, one gun, one jukebox that have been imbued with paranatural powers because they are socially perceived as like archetypal objects, media objects. And so throughout the game, these are kind of possessed by the hiss um, in order to take advantage of their powers. And Jesse performs a ceremony, um, which is called like binding them. She binds them to cleanse them of the hiss and then to receive their special powers. So again, like I mentioned, these objects of power, mostly media objects. None of them are objects that uh, exist a priori of human uh, intervention. These are all objects that have been developed and made by humans and often they're mostly media objects. Another example is a floppy disk, for example. Um, and part of why I see post-human relationism and, and resonance kind of reflecting here is because these objects of power, the special powers that they are imbued with, that they resonate with, um, come about because of their attachment to a specific social meaning or understanding of what these objects do what they do. Um, so um, they, I'll, I'll go into a few specific details of, of a few specific objects in a second. But what part of my argument is, is that control here is trying to represent how 
um, through this kind of uh, metaphor of these paranatural powers. They're trying to show how objects become imbued with specific social meetings over long periods of time through kind of this archetypal, this vast social like um, exposure to them, right? And then, and circulated understandings of what they mean. So um, in order to uh, relate this to post-human relationism, what I'm talking about here is specifically that these objects um, have been one made by human beings, right? So, so it's not like they just are a rock, right? They, they have been made by human beings. They've been toyed with, right? There are materials within them that have been toyed with. But then after humans have like made them, right, quote unquote, made them, the social meanings of those objects also start to affect them as well. And that's kind of relating to the post-human relationism idea, where in order to fully understand an object, to understand the floppy disk, right, um, we can look at the materials, but fundamentally, these are also social objects, right? They have social meanings, and therefore, to fully understand an object, we need to understand also the social connotations behind them. So a couple of examples of these. Um, the first one is the hotline in the game. It is a red telephone. Um, and what the hotline allows Jesse to do is basically, again, it's not particularly well-defined, but either she communicates with the dead or across space-time, across universes, again, not very sure, but um, she uses the hotline to communicate with um, entities that are no longer living within the world of the game. So for example, here's a scene from the game where um, the previous director of the Federal Bureau of Control kind of shows up through the hotline, right? This red light behind him um, appears um, and we see his shadow. Um, and we can tell that he's like trying to communicate with Jesse through this hotline. And so um, again here, uh, the, like the resonance of the idea of the telephone as a communication device becomes part of the power it holds. Right, uh, it, it meaningfully allows her to communicate across space time because we use phones to communicate across space time. And then, and then the paranatural entity of the Hiss tries to possess it, Jesse cleanses it and gains that ability. Another example that is also very interesting is the service weapon. So this is the, the basically the gun that Jesse uses to attack entities, either the Hiss or other paranatural entities within the game. Um, and what's specifically interesting about the, the service weapon here is specifically how it is materially constructed um, and how that construction of the gun relates to this idea of resonance. So the gun has several different basically kinds of ways you can use it. There's different forms of the gun. And um, really only the first form, which is the one all the way on the left here, is like a solid what we would typically think of as like a normal gun, right? It's a solid piece of metal that is like soldered together that allows someone to shoot a bullet at something. All of the other forms of the gun are literally resonant in that like there are uh, the, the metal of them rearranged into different units and they're kind of held together by this resonant power, right? Either we can call it electromagnetism, it's never really explained to us, right? But all of these objects are kind of held together to reform this gun into a new role, a new purpose. Of course, again, it's all about uh, the social idea of a gun as an attacking object, right? She uses it to attack other entities, but it's able to kind of reform itself, recapitulate itself um, through um, the game as well. We have a couple of other examples here, like the safe, for example, is another object that uh, Jesse can cleanse. The, uh, the safe here, once she cleanses it, she gains the power of defense. So again, we uh, the social idea of, of the safe as something that can defend against, um, uh, against you know, robbers or thieves, but also the materially dense material of a safe here, the materiality of that is, is translated into the social understanding of defense, which then uh, imbues the object with this paranatural power, which then Jesse can take as the player. And finally, uh, one I find most interesting um, is the Bentikoff TV. Um, this is one of the objects that the Hiss takes over. And the Bentikoff TV here, um, uh, once Jesse kind of defeats the Hiss who have possessed it and have taken it over, it allows her to fly and float as if she was, um, you know, floating along the airwaves of a, of a television set, right? Um, 
again, that's something that's never explicitly stated in the game, but um, as a social meaning of understanding how a TV with an antenna works, right, of understanding what the airwaves are, um, this uh, cleansing this object gives her the ability to fly. Right, so we see a really a clear connection between the social understandings of these objects and the powers that they are given to the player. And um, pointing to the impossibility of knowing, right? Because part of post-human relationism is not only that objects have like these social resonances, that objects come into being, into human perception because of the social, but they also point out that we fundamentally cannot know the object a priori of the social. And this is reflected in some of the um, descriptions of these objects within the game. So you can find um, specific um, documents within the game that can tell you about these objects. Um, and so it'll, for example, here's the Benikoff TV um, file, and it'll say basically like where this object was found, like where randomly th this object suddenly started having powers, right? And it'll point to case numbers and it'll give some background information about the object. And here, um, as we can see, this is kind of echoing a, a government document and that there are certain lines that are crossed out, right? There are certain things that have been kind of struck in from the record. But um, so we could just see it as kind of representative of like government secrecy, right? But I think it also points to how these objects, we're not really exactly sure how these powers have developed, right? It's kind of that reflection of the impossibility of knowing a mediated object, um, you know, fully. Um, a priori of human um, knowledge. Same thing with, with a slide projector here. We're at time here. There. Yeah. Okay. I'm finishing right now. Um, so again, like I mentioned before, um, right, I, I kind of see the resonances here as, as the impossibility of knowing the object before social, um, right? The term resonance itself um, uh, means both that like something is emitting a sound and something is also attuned to it or, or kind of receiving that sound. Um, and so I, I'm, I've been trying to think this is kind of the first step in a long process of thinking about this game as a visual and oral metaphor of resonance for objects coming into the social. And, and like Merlin was saying previously, um, the object before the social as something eerie, spooky, and resonant is something that's really interesting to me and I hope to explore more. So thank you. Thank you very much, Duke. Um, it's great to have two papers about uh, one game. Uh, uh, just makes this knit together even better. So now we have our final paper of the morning for some of us, afternoon for others. This is Matthew Carricker, a PhD student at UWM, the mortal coil respawning as access to duration in FPS multiplayer contest. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. Okay, well, that's another kind of hiss. Huh? <laughs> okay, I'm going to share my screen. Now. So Everybody should be able to see it, and it's up there. Okay, good. So, yeah, my name is Matthew Carricker, and uh, this paper is about respawning as rapid duration in um, first-person shooter action game multiplayer contest. And my jumping-off point here is that, you know, the driving question for me is, like, why are these games so compelling? Um, so why are they so compelling? And if I click the button... Here we go. So um, <clears throat> this is a Halo Reach, which will be my case study. And I play it through the Halo Master Chief collection on my computer here in the, the game lab at UWM. I, I work with a dual monitor kind of thing, and that's gonna be important later because on one screen I've got Halo and then on the other screen, I'll have like the essay I'm writing or the, the things I'm grading or, or whatever. So uh, already setting up that sort, of, um, that sort of juxtaposition. So to get right into it, um, while killing is often centered in commentaries of action in first-person shooters as an expressive act, the kill-death ratio in most multiplayer games is exactly one. This means that participants are killed as much as they kill, if not more so, as in my case. 
In considering action games, uh, there is a tendency to focus on the meaning that they communicate about violence through jubilant depictions of war, glorifying militarism, and particularly during the time that I was growing up, uh, sort of uh, their commentary on the war on terror in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, in considering death in video games, uh, Jesper Yule has considered high stakes constructions of death as failure, uh, permadeath uh, in roguelikes, etc., as sort of gambling with meaningful emotions. Uh, yet the construction of death and respawning as low stakes engendering rapid replay has received less attention. However, the construction of death as rapid respawning is what I'm going to argue makes the experience of action games so compelling. Um, and so the first thing I'm going to go on to uh, is to talk about moving away from textual analysis. Um, and to do that, I'm going to draw a parallel from studies of ritual action in anthropology. So here we go. Um, so uh, Edward Schieflin, uh, writing on Kalili uh, seance rituals in Papua New Guinea, um, makes this claim against the sort of the, the thing that was popular in anthropology at the time, which was symbolic anthropology, that meaning centered examinations of ritual as text overemphasize the efficacy of symbols to work upon its ritual participants in a rational or intellectual manner. Participation in ritual action is always is more a matter of symbolic material being produced in specific restrictive ways, you know, for example, singing where everybody sings the same sort of uh, song or dance where everybody is doing sort of rhythmic uh, or pattern bodily movements, then it is about open-ended positive expression. Uh, the choreo this choreography serves to impose meaning upon the social event by bringing symbols and context into relation with one another within the order of performance. Such approaches overstate the power of symbols to convey information about, comment upon, or formulate some particular state of affairs about the world through their propositional force. The symbolic realm is thus an informationally impoverished one that relies upon the ordering of particip participation, and this is my input, uh, as a sequence in time to provide the context for its interpretation. So uh, when we shift then to consider games, um, I'm going to consider analog games first, and then think about what makes digital games different at the end and apply that to Halo Reach or my experience anyway. Uh, so Erwin Goffman, uh, writing about uh, action in games, says that uh, the action of games is usually resolved in a single continuous span of time, the same breadth of experience. Uh, this provides participation, sorry, this provides participants with insight into the consequentiality or faithfulness of their actions. Uh, Goffman identifies an example, uh, this example of flipping a coin uh, five phases that constitute the span of play, so heads or tails. Uh, there's squaring off, in which we agree to flip the coin and for some stakes. Uh, the determination, which is where we sort of, we let go of our ability to affect the situation and let that coin just rotate in the air. And then disclosure, where you find out whether it's heads or tails, and then we settle the, the, the odds. And that for him is a span of play that occurs uh, as a temporal phase. Now, the important thing is this fifth element, which he doesn't really do much to elaborate on, which is the pause. Now, pauses are the period, he says, between plays, and they link individual spans into longer sessions. Um, so what we can infer is that these longer sessions are made up of the temporal units of single play spans. And implicitly, there's then a connection to his conclusion in this piece where he says that as a result of, well, let me say that, you know, the pause implies you play again, right? And you reflect and go again. And the thing about games is that they readily make available these sequences for us to replay, right? Of course, nothing is ever the same, but nothing is ever radically different within a game as well. And so this affords uh, for gamblers, Goffman says, uh, an ability to perceive the potentialities for chance in situations others would see as devoid of eventfulness. The situation can even be structured so these possibilities are made manifest. So there's something about the temporal span of games and that they can stack into larger sessions which are made of the same temporal units that affords a kind of wider outlook onto everyday situations that might reveal more chanceful encounters and different kinds of agencies. So, um, oh, signpost statement. All right, moving on. So Thomas Malaby has explored ethnographically 
um, this idea of um, this idea uh, through gambling uh, on Crete and City of Kenya. And I'm going to draw attention to one example about a poker game to reveal something, you know, about analog games, which is different from digital games like uh, Halo Reach, which is procedural time and its functional relationship to social relations. So um, Mallory asks, uh, what moments of unpredictability reveal about the flow of time and social change? Uh, he explores the means by which gamblers make sense of unforeseen outcomes, but as they unfold in the context of a game that they're all structurating together, they're all making the, the procedural moves to keep the hands moving, to keep everything uh, fair and readable. But then the question is how they make sense of the unforeseen outcomes that come from that stability. As part of everyday experience with significant consequences, gambling games provide uh, for Malibu a semi-binded refraction of the precarious nature of everyday experience. And a point here, a kind of distillation of a chanceful life into a seemingly more apprehensive form. During the span of play, normal conventions are subordinated to those of the game, affording it a bounded quality. All the players share the intent of creating the appropriate conditions for the unpredictable outcomes to unfold. Um, so uh, I think I'm, I don't really need to go into this part, but Guri is a sort of ethnographic example from Kenya, which uh, like the English word auger is a sign or omen of good tidings an association of good fortune with approximate item person or practice. Um, and so Guri is a trope that sort of comes out in the pauses between poker hands in, uh, in the example uh, to sort of make sense of the emerging patterns of the outcomes and relate them to uh, concomitant, overlayered, you know, wider spheres of everyday life and social relationships. One particular one is sort of intergenerational tropes, but also the regularity by which people play poker and all of these things. Um, but what I'm interested in here is how we can think of Guri as a trope, but also as an example of how games as sort of uh, procedures that people all do together, align social relations with the procedural apparatus for creating or accessing duration. So that begs the question, um, what is duration? What does it mean to say that games offer us access to duration? Well, duration is abstractly and analogously defined as consisting of concrete qualitative multiplicities which divide continuously. It, you could say that they, they're the means by which we, we, we make patterns, recurring patterns out of experience. One example, a simple example, would be we divide the day into morning, afternoon, and night. These are qualitative multiplicities that we sort of know are different from one another, but they also recur so that today's morning is like tomorrow's morning, but it's also different, whereas morning is also different from afternoon. And this can be um, sort of put against quantitative multiplicities. So in that same example, a day is 24 hours, which and those hours can be divided, you know, and handled in different uh, sorts of ways. Um, Kember and Zelinska, uh, right of intuitive knowledge as contact with duration. And they say it's achieved with difficulty and even then it is fleeting and thus impossible to sustain. A moment of insight that moves theory on or contributes to knowledge, not least by challenging its very foundations. Um, and so what I'm interested in is how these temporal spans and analog games and ritual procedurally order the performance of participants to create contrived forms of duration that afford intuitive knowledge. In other words, we're always looking for intuitive knowledge to sort of make doing it on in the world, but things like games and ritual order our participation together to make that kind of contact with duration more readily available in a contrived form. But then of course, to go back to the Guri example, those contrived forms then work to create analogies with wider or ongoing social uh, parallels. So the example of procedural action in games and ritual context point to their ability to be used by actors to bring about a seeming contact with duration. Okay, so um, here's the important thing for the analog games, right, before I get on to the, just the finale of the talk with Halo Reach, which is that to use Roman Jacobson's term of fatic to mean that function of communication in which we know they're still there, you know, hello, you know, maintaining the medium of communication, there's a fatic and functional uh, relationship between the performance of procedural action and bringing about those complex results that we can all sort of enjoy together and the social relationships between participants. 
And Malaby is an example of sort of like leaning his foot on somebody's chair, which is a sort of a, a, a sort of kind of intimacy normally, but during the game is sort of like stop doing that, you know, because you're maintaining that boundary because otherwise there's no game, you know, otherwise there wouldn't be the outcomes for that to happen. But that's not the case with um, games as 21st century media as uh, Mark Hansen, who I'm leaning on a little bit here, um, has to say, because obviously what I'm going to say is that procedural action is maintained by the coded processes of the game. And so um, there's no longer that functional relationship between the social relationships uh, in the game and the social relationships that make the game. Um, so Hansen marks a distinction between lower order sensibility and higher order perception. And for him, it's like, all this stuff comes in and through our senses, and then we make sense of it through higher order um, modes of thought after the fact, and that sort of perception, consciousness, etc. The distinctive thing about 21st century media for Hansen is it is marked by a tendency to operate at micro temporal scales without any necessary connection to human sense perception or conscious awareness. So you've got these rapid durations like the 60 frames per second that run the screen or, or what, what have you. Um, and he says that there's a gap between our perception of communication technologies and their habitual operations as a result. There's a disconnect there. Um, and we're not really fully aware of the ways in which we're being, uh, in which we're participating. Digital technology has therefore exponentially accelerated sensibility, creating a distinction between those micro scale experiences and the macro scale figures of experience, perception, awareness, like I said. And as a result, deliberation shifts from being an activity that happens at the moment of reception, right, or in the pause between spans of play, to an activity that can only happen in a fundamentally anticipatory mode before any encounter. Uh, and this constitutes for Hansen the qualified subordination of the user to 21st century media forms. You know, we are part of the apparatus, we play the game, but in what way does the game play us? And so to return to um, Halo Reach, Last minute, no problem. So this is my final slide. Uh, the examples of procedural time in games and ritual contexts point to a sense of duration that is coeval and fatically driven by participants. This distinguishes the action of first person shooters from the action of analog games. In real time games like Halo Reach, there is no longer a functional relationship. Uh, so it's sort of like a Radcliffe Brown kind of thing. Uh, between maintaining the procedural action of the performance reality and the social relationships between the participants, which as anybody who's played a game like this will know, because everybody is so rude to each other and just constantly, you know, uh, telling each other to, I don't know, we all, we recognize that trope. The coded procedure of responding engenders the user into a procedural loop that allows no time to pause between plays for sensibility to become perception. And rapid respawning, therefore, intensifies and accelerates the coherence of duration, but orders our participation so that it feeds forward into the next span of play, therefore maximizing the probability that we'll spend more time on device. Um, and I think that that is the end of my presentation. So there we go. Yeah, so I'm, yes, now I'm going to get out of here. And we'll get back into that. Okay. Oh, oh, God. All right. Hold on. That should be fine. Okay. Hopefully. Yes. We're, we're getting better and better with that transition uh, or, or, or not. Uh, so thank you, Matthew. Appreciate that. Um, are you still sharing? Yes. So uh, thank you, everyone. Yeah. Claps all around. Uh, this was uh, quite, quite a wonderful pairing of these eight presentations. So. Um, do we have questions? And I think we might, you know, we've got about 20 minutes here, uh, like to entertain questions for this panel, and then we might have some as well uh, that can connect across, right, as we can weave those in too. So uh, do we have any hands? Uh, and I'm looking at the chat here. Jules, did you want to, uh, shall I read this question from you in the chat, or do you want to just pick it up? Uh, yeah, I'm quite happy just to pick it up, which is, um, oh, cool. Sorry. Uh, so uh, yeah, just um, 
one of the things here that I'm interested in uh, is the kind of opposite of rapid respawns, um, which is the gaming of pauses in particularly online sports games. Um, I should say that I don't play FIFA online. My son, um, essentially, I, I, it's, uh, I end up watching him playing it. He's 14 and he is often playing people on the Internet, in the leagues and these kinds of things um, where... Essentially, there's a, a gaming of pausing, of people repeatedly pausing the game, uh, hoping that you'll um, quit the game, forfeit the game in frustration, um, and thus they'll progress through the league more rapidly. And um, uh, yeah, I just wondered if you've got any thoughts on, on that, um, Matthew. Well, I guess the defense of the... Oh, we can't hear you very well, actually. Sorry. How's that? Does that, does that sound okay? As an extension of what I've been talking about just now, I guess um, playing of pauses, like intentionally, it sort of disrupts things, doesn't it? Because it brings all of these, uh, it brings all of these gameplay loops to you know a standstill, and that can be quite jarring, right? And it can actually maybe provoke frustration, you know, in the way that we anticipate to be able to do the next thing for it to respond back to us and continue the loop, you know. But when it sort of uh, interjects there, that intervention of the pause from outside of, I guess, from an outside can sort of create that sort of frustration. But apart from that, I'd be interested to hear what other people think. And then I think they can't. Was, was that me? Sorry, I, I yeah. didn't quite hear that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Mine, mine's also for, um, for Matthew, hoping it carries on. I, I really like this idea of the sort of the procedural device offering access to or creating duration. Where I guess my follow-up question is, is what duration uh, are we being offered access to? Uh, is it the time of the machine? Um, is it a time of sort of mediated interpersonal coordination without the, with all the gaps kind of cut out? Um, you know, can, can we compare this to the sense in the ritual examples you've drawn to where the temp, the duration you're offered access to is in, in the classical literature, it's cosmic time mm -hmm. or eternity or something. So, so is this, is this about you know producing access to a machine time, or is it, is it something else? Well, that's an interesting question. I've thought about that too. Um, when you think about games like like poker and things, those are contrived forms of uh, semi-bounded contingency. So they're sort of a contrived time, but the duration of them sort of fits in with wider time. You need that sort of relationship between social relations in order to produce. Sorry, I'm going to a bit quiet. Uh, to produce those durations, you know, maybe makes them more amenable to sort of, you know, rhyme with other durations going on. The question about, you know, computer driven procedure uh, and the durations they give us access to, I think is a question for further research and for even experimentation. You know, uh, in terms of, you know, Hansen, he, he sort of puts forward a method that, you know, maybe. I mean, not to be, but the to return to the the point, um, I think that it's a uh, it's an open question because it's a question of design, right? I think that in terms of the the programmatic potentials for procedural durations, you know, it is an extension of of digital design, and so it's open to, I don't know, it's open to uh, creative responses, maybe. <laughs> Uh, Ryan House suggested uh, the two timeouts seem to relate maybe by their order of coherence, the respawn as a centering experience, the other being like those edges of that mad parody. And I think that's a very, very interesting connection to draw up our third paper. Uh, so Rat, you wanna go ahead? Sure, let me, I have like 16 mutes on to make sure I don't accidentally uh, destroy the stream. So give me a moment to reorder all of that. So this, uh, uh, we, this question- We've done plenty of that, Brent, so, so don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a couple uh, things. Uh, well, one thing really for two people, which then becomes a couple things. Um, 
uh, for each of our lovely uh, remedy heads, our lovely um, uh, control theorists, I have to ask you a complicating question, uh, and I'd like to get your take on how it relates to your work, or if maybe it doesn't. Um, of course, you both rely to some degree on the interior logic of Remedy's control, and I'll admit it's hard not to. The, uh, the uh, objects of power are a really enticing metaphor. Um, you know, the oldest house is a very enticing metaphor in its own. Uh, but one of the things about the oldest house that I find very interesting is that it is temporally shifted uh, a degree back from uh, the present moment. So the oldest house can only uh, actuate on the objects within the cultural imagining circa about 1970, 1980. The specific line is not derived, right? But this is interesting for a game that com came out you know, 2019, right? So this this puts the oldest house somewhere between, uh, you know, what, 40 and 50 years back uh, within its its cultural imagining, its uh, sense of the collective unconsciousness. How does that change, uh, in, in to a degree, the relationship we may have to the archetypes that are present in David's case, uh, and in um, in Merlin's case, the uh, relationship we may have to the structures within the oldest house. Yeah, Merlin, we can't hear you, unfortunately. <laughs> Maybe my headset ran out or something. You know? Now we can hear you. Cool. I'm so sorry. I was just going to say, if you wanted to jump in, you could. But uh, I'm going to attempt a bridge between our two papers, which is to say, uh, so Campbell Adol's thesis is kind of an umbrella term that post human relationism, which encompasses all new materialisms, including things like thing theory, uh, which I'm very interested in. <laughs> and things, I guess, speak to this temporal lag in interesting ways, as, uh, as Brown and Miller and others conceive of them, in that through the well, obsolescence, is itself something that allows the things and object to emerge. This kind of weird power becomes apparent. Um, Brown uses the figure of this typewriter eraser, which is a weird kind of flail you put in a typewriter and blown up into a large sculpture by Clay Oldenburg. Uh, and like people looking at it, they have no idea what it is, and this strange thing conjures all kinds of unknown relations that might speak to other kinds of unknown process, and logistic or, or potential ritual function, you know, as we're all fond to claim things do. So for me, there's something about that lag that does that, um, I would say. But I, to bridge this maybe to a question as well to David, I've to add one more thing in the pot. There are multiple functions to these objects, these objects of power, and maybe they speak to this temple, but I don't know, like the... Like the gun is a gun, but it also is a key at various points. You can lock it in and open things with it. I don't know if that speaks to perhaps changing like the dynamic or like um, diachronic qualities of an object's social media. Yeah, I think something too that I was thinking about um, that neither of us mentioned is the panopticon in the game as well, um, and how part of the like part of the narrative in the game is that the Federal Bureau of Control house, attempts to house all of these objects very unsuccessfully, by the way, um, in, a, in a place called the Panopticon, very on the nose. Um, and I think Merlin had mentioned in, in their presentation that one of the items is a fridge, right? That needs to constantly be looked at unless, or and if you like look away from it, it will kill you basically. Um, so something I've been thinking about in relationship to this too, is this idea of, hauntology, I know Derrida mentions like that quote from Hamlet where he says time is out of joint, right? And, th and that kind of reminds me a little bit of this too, where there's there's this weird mix of kind of the hauntological, like the, the, the specter of the past occurring in here, but also it's a, but also like the necessity for viewing and surveillance of the past is another thing I'm interested in. Don't really have fully developed ideas about, but but I think that's part of it too, is the idea of like the necessity of, of, of viewing or of, of perceiving um, is something that I'm interested in um, as well. Yeah, I mean, my thoughts on this are, are still kind of in the primary stages, but yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, and there's a question from or a comment from the chat, Jules, if I can share that, which I thought was very interesting. Something to throw into the mix regarding control um, is the question, is it as easy for us to place it in time as we might think? 
Uh, Jules is thinking there of, I'm not going to try and pronounce Simon. Uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce the last name without screwing it up. I'm sure Tales from the Loop, which is both retro and speculatively futuristic, although as a kind of used feature. Jules, did you want to speak a bit more about that? Uh, not really. I mean, it's, it is a comment rather than a question yeah. so much. Um, but um, if people aren't aware of Tales from the Loop, then it is well worth looking at as a series on Amazon Prime. Um, but it originates as a series of illustrations. Oh, Merlin's holding it up, I think. Um, great. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, it seems to be both set in an um, undisclosed past and an undisclosed future. It's, it's quite a strange... Um, uh, ambiguous um, time frame. Yeah, and I think too, um, that's a great point, Jules, because I, I think control is also a part of, I mean, it's doing a couple of things a little different, but it also is engaging with like that retro futurism of very similar games that came out around the time of like Horizon Zero Dawn, where the setting is a lot different, but the relationship between time and the past and and that is kind of all murky, right? Um, and there's there's lots of uh, there's kind of a lineage within games of that mix of the retro futurism. And usually it's more along the lines of Horizon Zero Dawn, where it's more of like the, you know, past, like ancient tribal past, right, with, with future technology, whereas this is a little more condensed in terms of that, that retro futurism. Um, yeah, Stranger Things is another great example, right? Um, so I think, I think that's part of it too, right? It's just like the the ability of this genre to be like legible to the audience as well is another huge part of this, but they're engaging with the, the past and, and with the objects of the past in like that more hauntological or, or eerie view as Merlin would put it. I was saying ontology every five seconds. But I think there's also an interesting way in which the time of the Anthropocene is involved in this and that your example of Horizon Zero Dawn, which is about deep time, the oldest house is well, the oldest house. And yet these things also engage the recent past and kind of weird loops. So there's a way in which like um, it talks about the strange, I guess Morton would call it the dark uncanniness of the fact that we're in both temporal registers at once. Um, and that itself is kind of strange. Uh, Rent. Sorry, I had to switch the, the my mic on on the stream as well. I'd like to ask of uh, Ryan and Jules in no particular order. Uh, both the Stanley Parable and uh, obviously a VR experience are dealing with ontology on some level. Uh, in the case of the Stanley Parable and in the case of uh, the piece, um, uh, the Beginner's Guide, the ontology may be metaphoric, but it's still being represented. Um, in the case of uh, what you're dealing with, Jules, the ontology is, uh, I would argue, pushing the bounds of what we might consider to be metaphoric. Um, I'm curious, especially in the case of what Jules was talking about, because uh, there was a good deal of slippage in terms of judging size and scale between uh, what we would consider to be the physical world and what we consider to be the virtual world, in the case of what Ryan was talking about, because uh, identification is happening while the narrators are forcing you in different ways or challenging your ability to identify uh, in both cases. Um, how you negotiate those ont ontologies in your own work. I'm quite happy for Ryan to go first. Uh, okay, in the absence then of, uh, of, of something there, um, I think the key thing for me is um, that sense of understanding the, yeah, it is a, a virtual, these are virtual objects and um, that I play explicitly with um, that notion of virtuality in what I'm doing in terms of the, uh, there are glitches that are intentional in it. And so I'm actually drawing attention to the fact that this is a digital environment. Um, and it's those kinds of glitches that are not likely to happen, um, although it, they can sometimes happen in, in the real world. Um, uh, glitches and slippage was actually the word that you'd used there. Um, I'm intentionally introducing slippage into the work um, and drawing attention to 
uh, the fact that, it, that this is a digital thing. Um, one of the questions that I o often raise with my students or of my, ask of my students is, um, what are the things that you can only do with this medium? And those are the things that you should really try to do um, with it. Um, that's where the interesting uh, thing for me is it, and uh, it is in it. And so again, um, in terms of that endless loop, uh, you kind of get get stuck into places. Um, there's a horror game which I can't remember, which is essentially just a corridor, and each time you move down the the, the corridor, um, there's subtle shifts and and um, subtle changes in it. But um, uh, it's those subtle changes because again. Um, of the the random element that certain things stay the same in my environment other things are rebuilt every time you enter it you'll never experience it the same way twice um, and that again changes uh, the overall uh, aspect of of what it its nature is uh, I'm gonna get to Tom's question it does it, what you just said Jules it, it does make me think about Joey Saber uh, and, and the way in which the uh, manipulation of the environment in potentially micro ways can, can shape the experience of being within it. Uh, very interesting to think about that connection. Um, so, uh, Ryan, I guess, did you, oh, yeah, Ryan, give you a chance to respond there and then. Sure, get yeah. Um, I, I wanted to thank Jules for fielding it first because it gave me a little more time to think. I, where I was going was um, definitely thinking about how I am absolutely concentrating on the um uh, the ways that video game you know the medium of video games affords particular ways for the uh, the author to engage the audience right on on sort of the semiotic level and the procedural level uh and i think jules said that better than i could uh while you were talking though i thought back to uh the presentation i did last year with thomas and uh, his idea of the digitally natural and the way that these kinds of constraints in a virtual world um, are ontologically different than the ones on a board game, for instance, because they because you're you're confronted as you set up the board game with all of these uh, constructed contingencies that you are about to be engaged with. But in the video game, you you boot it up, and and these things are generally, even if it's just sort of you know the numbers of uh, the effects of what you are doing. Uh, are generally sort of hidden from you and um, only mediated to you through a metaphor, like we've been sort of talking about all day. I don't know if that was co co cohesive, but yeah. Okay, and nodding from Ren. So I, I'll, I'll go ahead and go on to Tom then and then Ren. Sure, I, I just had a quick question for Joey because I really enjoyed that talk and I feel like uh, those of us who study humans would would mostly probably commit to an idea that that animal play should be coextensive with what we're, that what we're talking about is not purely a human phenomenon uh, that it, that it has connections with animals like far far beyond chimpanzees as well and we can argue how how far we think that goes and I I just wondered from the perspective of your work is there scope for comparing the kinds of play and environmental design you're doing with um, with game design or with human environmental design or, or thinking about mediations between chimpanzee and human play or, or play between chimpanzees and humans. Like, is it, I, but just because I know that many sort of ethologists are pretty committed to, or pretty keen to protect against anthropomorphism and not, not to impose human categories on animals. So I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how, how we might think about that. Yeah, it is like when you talk about games, it, it, it can be a whole nother level from from play, I guess. They, I mean, a lot of the play behaviors in humans is very similar, like, you know, kids playing in the playground, whatever, making up uh, whatever they do. But um, yeah, there, there's... I mean, it's hard to tell. It's a very difficult like line to draw. Like, what's just uh, uh, how are their interactions going? Is play more for for them? It's uh, involves kind of just like 
manipulating and affecting change on the environment and on each other um, rather than, I guess, the more, I don't know, because like play wrestling, that kind of has a goal to it, but it kind of doesn't. They kind of, a lot of these kind of skill learning types of play are, have that, that uh, aspect of the handicapping and just kind of exploring uh, the different outcomes that could be achieved within it rather than um, the kind of, I guess, game thing where you, you can get to a point where you're more uh, testing your, like, uh, the degree of your abilities at, at something or, um, I don't know. But yeah, but then games that aren't competitive, then that's, I think that's very, very much similar. And it's just like, you're just trying to see what happens and, and become stimulated. And yeah, I don't know. Um, and then in terms of like play between species, like there there is plenty of um, play like towards, uh, there can be play when different primates. So sometimes like gibbons and orangutans are housed together and that like works out really great for both of them because they'll play together even though they have that species difference. And there is play between humans and chimpanzees which can sometimes be beneficial and sometimes like detrimental because it shows like they can't handle their relationships with others, but yeah. 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 Joy, Joy, I think that was a really great response. And um, you know, I see that connection with Fort Thompson from earlier today, too. How do you handle something that you see as rife for all kinds of uh, problematic use, you know, in its circulation, uh, but still, when you want to handle it and talk about it from a scholarly point of view? Let's just, we're going to have to wrap up because we're kind of at time here. Let's give Merlin the, the last uh, moment here. Go ahead, Merlin. We lost, we lost you again there, again. Merlin. Got to do that little, whatever the same switch was. We'll need to hit that again. Not yet. No, still nope. watching for it. There. Oh, I heard a brief. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Yes. I don't know. Bluetooth magic. Uh, yeah, sorry. It's another question for Joey because um, I really loved, really all the really interesting methodical issues it raises or interesting solutions it raises as well. I had a kind of method -y question. Um, I'm really interested in animal studies, especially from a kind of queer animal studies kind of perspective. Um, and yeah, on, <laughs> and thinking about ethologists and lines they draw, it got me thinking about Bagamil's uh, exuberant nature, sorry, biological exuberance, which takes ethologists to task for, for refusing to, to see, yeah, see human values in animals in lots of ways in terms of sexuality and stuff. But I was wondering about the really cool stuff you start off with in talking about being able to gauge stress or kinds of affect, maybe emotion in in chimps through yeah through through ethology through seeing their attitudes, behaviors, poses, um, and indeed altering that through kinds of rhythm and different interaction, different activities. And I guess it was that just blew my mind because I've been ages thinking that there's the language barrier in the Wittgensteinian way is just a hard one where you can't. I often do like thinking about plays and they can cross between species, but but there are very much clear limits in being able to be able to read, I guess, or to, yeah, to see or hear the animal. And I, I wonder, is there other techniques that you have which are really pertinent to your practice? Um, or yeah, are other examples you wanna talk about? Yeah, there's a bunch of them and they all, there's like problems with all of them, but they all kind of, you have to consider multiple at once. So there's things like the, you know, scratching themselves and things that we can kind of tell are, are, anxious type behaviors and like general abnormal behaviors like things that you don't see in the wild um like the kind of uh playing with feces that doesn't usually happen in the wild there's stuff like that and then there's like quantitative stuff like measuring uh, glucocorticoids um in you know hair or, or urine or whatever else um yeah, and then there's like the activity stuff. But yeah, there's there's a lot of problems with all of them because like you can have, they might move more if they um, are, like if they're really stressed out, they might pace around more or whatever. Or if they're really, really stressed out, they might not move at all. They might just shut down. And 
so there's kind of yeah it's very complicated but what has been found to your point is that there's been development in all these different metrics but the um human subjective evaluations of of the chimpanzees of their emotional states have like correlated really well with um the like a lot more expensive uh more quantitative ways of determining their their emotional states so yeah i, I think our empathy really uh lends itself to determining how they're doing. And it's really an evolutionary tool that's developed over time, you know, across, you know, at least mammalian species. And especially like for something like a chimpanzee or other primates that are so closely related, we share some of the same cues. And even when you don't share as many of the same cues, like with dogs, like you can, you can, we should be using that same um, that tool that's innate in us in order to make these evaluations, and it has proven in in the data to uh, to really track well with with other methods. It's a yeah, I think that was well said. It's it's a delicate issue. It reminds me of the anthropologist Matthew Gutman's uh, work, and he wrote a more popular press book called Our Men Animals, which looks at testosterone as this kind of rhetorical football in a similar way as dopamine. And, and he has to deal with some of the, these exact issues looking at the way in which animal environments are used as an excuse for a certain kind of construction, right? Uh, but that shouldn't keep us entirely from, from trying to make use of what we can uh, in these kinds of um, analogies. So uh, let's, let's wrap it up there. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I wanna give particular thanks to the organizers of this event, uh, Matt Carriker, Tom Boylston, all the folks at the Game Worlds Cluster, the University of Edinburgh, our producer, uh, uh, Ren Dalton, thank you so much for uh, all of that today. Uh, and everyone who's involved, Janelle Maligon, uh, the managing director of Series Play right now. So everyone, I think it was a, it was a wonderful job. Uh, I've got a lot to think about after today. Um, my 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 co-conspirator, Stuart Maltrup, uh, I always defer to him when it comes to trying to articulate the significance of happening. But uh, if, I, if I were to try my best, I, I would say this is um, the beginning of, I think, a lot of productive further conversations. And it's very exciting to participate in it. I want to thank you all again. Thanks, everyone. Recording stopped.